borrowed time, the clock tick fast. I'm living off borrowed time, the clock tick fast. I'm living off borrowed time, the clock tick fast. Off time, the clock tick fast. So I guess we should get to it. I will try and kind of ease into the intro here. So we are, uh, right, Wyatt, this is where you should start paying attention, and this is where I'm going to probably botch this 20 times. But, you know, Living Off Borrowed Time podcast... I'm your host, as always, Patrick, Patrick McGovern, Patrick on RYM, joined this week, not by Caleb. He's mad at me about an episode I'm going to be doing a few months down the line. Wyatt knows what I'm going to throw up real quick here. But I'm um, joined this week by somebody who came up with a suggestion that I'm very happy about, uh, Thought Foul on RYM. You might know him from our Rock Marciano episode. And uh, this, this week he has a, uh, not quite a legend, but somebody who maybe in their own way is a legend. Somebody who kind of follows doom in a way that you might not think of he's definitely wrapped over some doom stuff like everybody influenced by doom mr motherfucking x wire and if you follow this podcast there's a certain type of rapper that we definitely favor over here you know like a per- certain type of personality and i think mm-hmm. x wire really fits that personality like you know you're vic spencer you're your old droog like going back to red man type personality and I think X Squire has been forgotten. So I'm really glad that you brought him up for a topic for this episode because he's somebody I wouldn't have thought to bring up. And I guess a good way to start would be why of all the rappers, because he's really like he's been active and we'll get into that. But he's only been out of the consciousness for a while. So how did you come to X Squire? What made you think of him for this episode? So um, now if X Squire himself is listening to this, don't cut this off. But I think the first time I, because he doesn't like the song, I think I first heard him on the Hazar remix, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, at the time, I was like, I think I was still kind of in my like uh, underground, you know, Jedi mind tricks kind of phase. So I, I thought it was cool to like get too into it. And then uh, a couple of years later, there was um, a movie that came out called Rebel Kings. It's like a documentary about um, about like. Uh, gangs in the in New York in the seventies and like didn't El do a soundtrack for that? Yeah, yeah. So it's about like our uh, gangs and um, th- like the emergence of hip hop in New York and um, not LP, but um, is it Little Shalimar who's like the oh. co-producer for Run the Jewels? He put together the soundtrack and Esquire's on it. He's got a song called um, I think it's Warrior Thing, which is real tight. I thought this was pretty sick. And then there's another song in there as well where it's him, Ghostface, and Baldy James, which is, like, from, what, 2013, 14, 15, something like that, which is also pretty tight. But um, what really made me pay attention was um, the song Green Ranger when he had the punchline, big gun, bucking like an earthworm gym. When I heard that, I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, we're gonna I'm talk a fan for life now. I'm a, I'm a fan for life because that's, that's some genius-level shit. So... Yeah, and then from there, I just kind of, I guess, went backwards a bit. And then um, the more I listened to him, I was like, this guy is actually, in my opinion, like, if, if you're going to talk about, like, technique uh, and all that kind of stuff, is one of the best of the 2010s. And, yeah, that's what I think, at least. And, I, I mean, we'll probably get into it as we go on. But I just find it he's, like, very vers- versatile um, and, like, yeah, he can do all sorts of different flows. Has you know very interesting content, um, interesting production choices. I don't know. He's he's the kind of dude that like it, it's a real shame that for whatever reason the spotlight went off him because um, yeah, he, you know he, he got a lot of hype at first, but um, over time that went away. I don't know if it's because he was blackboard or whatever, but it's a real shame. And I, I kind of wanted to bring more attention to that because there is a lot of great stuff that has just been completely missed. A lot of people. And I will mention as well, there's stuff that even I had missed uh, going into this episode. I think we cover pretty much everything, like one or two things that I didn't get to. But even so, it's more coverage than like anywhere else. So fuck it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess just real quick in case um, anybody who's more of a completist that like I'm sure he has some diehard fans or possibly himself listening to this episode. I personally missed the first two of his Mary X Miss and smd uh you know what that means as a um hardcore wrestling fan of the 2000s he will get that reference that's a really terrible reference um to the natural born thrillers stable notorious ratings killers um but yes that stands for suck my dick because he's going to talk about that a lot he has a lot of opinions about his dick and what you should do with it um i missed the first two volumes of that unfortunately uh so you can cover those the third volume i did here and i 
very positive opinions on. So I missed that. Um, bootleg liquor on a Sunday night, the whole drunken affair, I was not able to find anywhere. Um, yeah, neither. RYM, we'll also do a lot of complaining about the RYM page. Um, mm -hmm. It's not very useful. He considers his self-titled 2019 effort to be his debut album. And when we listen, when we talk about it, it's very evident that that's structured that way. So everything else up to that seems to be a mixtape, even though RYM seems to think that Mary X Must Suck My Dick, Bootleg Liquor, and Capsule Volume 1 are all albums. Pretty sure they're not. Uh, um, but yeah, so I haven't heard any of those three, and I'm also missing off his band camp uh, Le Secret Legend Volume 1 for September, vol some, yeah, September 2020, because that was only available for limited streaming. However... Depending on how much he wants for it, I was impressed enough by everything I listened to for this episode. I might just kick him the money for it. We'll see. He's asking a lot for some stuff, so we'll mm. see. I spend a lot of money on Bandcamp. My wife's one day going to check the account and be like, the fuck are you doing? So it's like, <laughs> then you'll look at all these songs from this guy and be like, the fuck are you spending your money on? Like, <laughs> Merry Christmas and Suck My Dick Volume 3. That it's sounds a like weird phrase. porn, but... <laughs> um, and then she looks at the album art. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some great album covers. Legion yeah, oh no, uh, as, as established before, we are you know, aficionados of album art. And at the very least, just looking right now, uh, Mary Xmas 3 has classic album art. Uh, yeah. Kismet has uh, disturbing and amazing album art. Um, yeah. Just kind of reminiscent of uh, ba um, both My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy and also Lil B's take on My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. And... Um, this like a is it Miguel has an album cover which is like somewhat similar as from memory. I don't know. It's like a kind of cosmic sexual kind of thing going on. I feel like there's some similarity there as well. But yeah, and the, the, also like uh, I kind of appreciate that. Like for the absurdity of it, there's like a cohesive, like just with his rapping too, a weird mm. thematic and artistic cohesiveness to his album art. Like the same theme, like the same themes come up. I mean, they might just be drinking, fucking, dorkiness. But, and it just seems like he is, and we'll come back to this, he's got a lot of influences, but he's like also, he's ultimately a one of one, I think. Yeah. And that's what's really impressive about him. And yeah. this might be like copacetic with the Rock Marciano episode, because, you know, Rock, you don't have Rock without Raekwon. I'm sure we covered this in the episode. You don't have Rock without his influences, but there's no one who could replace Rock Marciano. And I don't think there's anyone who can replace Mr. Motherfucking Esquire either. Like, I mean, there's no Mr. Motherfucking Esquire without Danny Brown or Doom or Cool Keith. But when you get down to when you get into the weeds of his discography, no one else could make this music. It's yeah. weird. It's uncompromising. It's yeah. unflinching. But it's, I mean, well, we'll start at the very beginning here with the big fat kill. This is the only time I think that he sounds like somebody else a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that like, other people could have made this album, but even here you see his character, like his signature characteristics. And I think that this is just, yeah, like this is the jumping off point, And this is the last time he sounded like anybody else. And I think that I'm trying to, you know, I'm doing a very poor job of this. I'm trying to thread this together. Like I was saying, there's a certain type of rapper that we really gravitate towards on this podcast, at least myself. I can't really speak for our absent co-host or absent producer. But like rappers with a personality who might be like synthesis syntheses of previous rappers, but ultimately are their own stand on their own to going up to and including somebody who just released an album that I think have you heard the Earl album? No, not yet. Um I will after this though. Um I'm just my 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 good headphones are currently getting fixed and I want to, you know, have a proper listen. So um I'll get to yeah, it. But, it deserves yeah. it for that reason. Yeah. I was just trying to promote the episode we're doing after this too. But like up mm -hmm. to and including that, like I mean, Doom, obviously, we just, well, at the time you've heard this, we'll have just released a massive three-part episode on Doom. Like, he's like the patron saint of this podcast. The name of the podcast comes from him. There's, like, rappers who follow in the lineage, but ultimately forge their own path. And Esquire mm. is one of those, and he's fallen under the radar. And for the most part, all of his work is something nobody else could have made. There's one out mixtape, I'm sorry, that somebody else could have made. It's this one. And it's still great. But yeah. it feels a little bit... And I'm not just saying this because it has beats from Theodore Unit by way of MF Doom, but it feels like a lost Theodore Unit, Ghostface, Trife to God type mid-2000s mixtape. And that's a pretty good place to be, by the way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, on this one, I've just kind of got some notes here in terms of what he goes over. So he goes over the fish beat from Ghostface. Uh, he goes over, I think, the beef rap one by Doom. Um, Gobstopper by Dilla. There's a posse cut, which is the Daytona 500 beat from mm. Raycom. Um, What's Brooklyn the My, chemi- my Chemical Romance is which one? Um, that's the five minute one, I believe. Uh, that's, yeah, that's um, it's like right in the middle. What the fuck is that? Do, 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 do. I thought that was Ghidorah, but it might not be. Oh no, you're right. It's the one that's yeah. It was also um, on a. I think Joey Badass used that same beat on 1999 as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right. So yeah, but I think most of this is like kind of woo beats, right? It's like in that, like I said, Theodore unit, which I think is like you're in that ghost space space, like that ghost space fish scale space where it's like woo, but it's when ghost space kind of realized that like the doom Dilla space existed. So he's mm. kind of migrating from, the na- he's making that natural migration from Supreme clientele, bulletproof wallets over to the woo space. So I'm, I'm sorry, the doom space from the woo space. So mm. it's that sort of instrument, like, that's where Esquire is, and I think that makes sense for somebody his age rapping the way he does. And I think one of the big reasons I really gravitate towards Esquire, and we'll get really into this when we get to um, the Live Forever EP, which has one song which just like clubbed me with, like, this is why I like this guy, is that mm. he is... Uh, how old are you? I'm 28. Okay, so you're... I wouldn't say significantly younger than me, but younger than me. Mm. Um... X Squire is one year older than me. X Squire is pretty much exactly I, in my generation, and the shit he raps about, the references he makes, especially hmm. the dorky ass ref- wrestling references, which I know yeah. Kale, I can already hear Kel's eyes blazing over when I talk about them, and I want to talk about them a lot. Like this dude mentions Bob Backlund more times than Malcolm. He references ways to flip you. <laughs> he references Bob Backlund more ways more times than Conway references his young shooter. Like, yeah. So, like he's pretty much exactly in my niche that way. So I'm pretty much, and this is the one album where you get aspects of that, but not the whole picture, but you can already tell. But in terms of like, when this came out, this is the type of shit I was listening to. If I had the skill to rap this way, this is the type of stuff I'd be rapping over. Honestly, when I was going around with my friends and we were bullshitting and smoking and fucking rapping, we were rapping over these type of special herbs and shit. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that this is the type of, you know, these were the beats he went over. Yeah. And absolutely. subject matter wise, it's not too far off from, I mean, he's, you know, not quite as horny as he would be in the future, but it's basically bragging bullshit. Like, not, is this the intersection's not really there yet, but other than that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like this is, yeah, again, just him rapping his ass off, you know, like, um, and <laughs> one thing I found really funny is, is on, like, the intro track, he says something like, if you want to get high, if you want to get drunk, smoke some crack, whatever it is the <laughs> fuck you do, like, you're all hyped up, you know, um, whereas, and he, he tries to make a distinction between him and, like, other mixtape rappers as well, but, yeah, there are li- kind of little glimpses, you know, like you were saying with the kind of whole uh, pop culture thing, like, on Gears of War, he says, you know, built from scratch like Gum Dum. And then um, there's another <laughs> line on Water Crack Extravaganza where he says, tossing hammers like King Cooper at the end of the door. So you, you're kind of getting this like very Brooklyn um, kind of hardcore shit, but you're also getting the kind of pop culture references finding their way in. Um, and yeah, a lot of it is just him just rapping his ass off. But there is, I think there's a couple songs. Oh, yeah, The Departed is more like a kind of introspective more personal song, but it's just him going like going demolition off. man, where he's just like fuck you, fuck the label, or fuck yeah. this, fuck that. Like he's very like, and that's something that'll be a recurring theme around his career, where he'll come up with something introspective, and then I'll follow it with the foulest shit imaginable. Oh yeah, shit imaginable. And I think he shares that with Danny, and ter- and like obviously he did a lot of work with Danny. Like one of his best mm-hmm. songs, "Tomorrow's Gone," is with Danny, mm-hmm. and like that song, and two of his best songs, you know, the obvious "Last Is Odd." Danny's on that. Like that was like one of the first reference points I always thought of with him was Danny. Mm. So, the yeah, I, I, I feel the comparison of him being like an East Coast Danny Brown is 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 pretty pretty on point to be honest. I mean, I think it's they both have a way of saying really filthy, unrelatable shit in a way that's profoundly human because of the context they surround it with. 
Yep, for sure. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if you just want to hear a dude rap his ass off over, you know, classic beats, it's a, it's, it's a good tape. Well, I mean, it's a great tape. It's a great place to start. Um, but as you were saying, I guess his his, his, his uh, personality is, is mostly formed here, but it's not – and it's like, you know, like maybe 95% there. There's still a couple things that I guess he kind of um, – he does more of uh, as you kind of get deeper into his, into his discography. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's, I'd say it's, if you're going chronologically, it's not one to skip. It's not like, you know, Freddie Gibbs or Makami type thing where it's like a baby picture that you can just skip forward to where they're much further along in their career. Like, I think it's worth starting here because he's pretty much where he would end up. It's not like drastically different, although you could say that about Mach too, I guess, but not so much Gibbs. But I think that quality, like, you know, quality wise, concept wise, it would come a lot farther later on um, by Lost in Translation, which I guess, well, I'm going to look at the dates here. Well, I guess Mary Xmas would be well, what's on Xmas. So, uh, yeah, so I think- I'm not as versed on, like, because, yeah, we have this is 2008, and then Lost in Translation is, I don't know, September 11th. That had to be on purpose. That had to be on purpose. Oh, yeah, surely, yeah. <laughs> Knowing who it is, that's absolutely on purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. So there was nothing between this and Lost in Translation. I mean, on RYM there isn't, at least. Uh, nothing yeah, as far as I'm aware, there isn't. Yeah. Yeah, because um, that was, like, basically I was most aware of him based on either Smoking Section or Passion of the Weiss had the uh, last Za remix. I'm pretty sure it was Passion of the Weiss, but, and I looked at it more or less because of the Danny Brown feature, because I was not... I hated Das. I hated Das Racist. I guess this is we're going to start with Last Is All. Like, I mean, I know he's probably already downloading this video and throwing a forty at the fucking phone or whatever because this is. You said he hates this song, I guess, but there's no avoiding it. It's the fucking elephant in the room. It's the song that defines him. The necro beat, everything, and it's a perfect song. It's one of my favorite songs of the 2010s. And I'm sorry if he hates it, but it's a perfect song. I'm sorry you made a perfect song, dude. Like. <laughs> It's yeah, and I guess how would you rank the? Uh, okay, so was this the first? Did you hear the song? You know, you heard the Rumble King song first. You said right? No, no, I, I, heard, I heard Last is our first because okay. I was a big LP so fan. When you heard it first, whose verse did you like best? Um, it might have been Al's because of the Fukushima breezes line. Um. Ooh, yeah, yeah that, I, I that's can't a really remember. It was line. Pre- pretty, pretty vague. Like when I was, you know, first discovered it. Um, I think it might have been Al's. But listening to it again now, I, I, I really like uh, the Despot verse. I mean, they're all really good verses. Um, and also, uh, I don't know. There's like some video online where it's on YouTube and it's some some channel. Oh, it's not to... on YouTube anymore. It keeps getting taken down. You have to go to Vimeo. No, 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 no sorry, not, not the video itself. I mean, someone did a, a video on the song itself, and it's like oh. I forgot great posse cut of blah 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 and i feel like people actually slept on each squire's verse <clears throat> quite a lot as well because oh, no. you um, really i mean awesome. so my my <laughs> thing about this is that it's the verse i least think about but then you think about some lines in it and first of all mm. when it came out it's like 2011 and mm. watch the throne just came out he has one line on here like even when it wasn't my favorite verse it's still not my favorite ultimately one of the things i was going to say is there is no best verse on this they're all essentially equal even Heems, who objectively he's hemes you know Hamanchu is just gonna suck and he knows it he's like uh but he still has i got three shirts and they all look expensive yeah <laughs> 95 volkswagen man old and dented like that's fucking funny like that's the funniest shit nas race has ever said it's also mm-hmm. like the first verse where i was just like cool keith is that i we need to cancel this podcast right now i just called cool ad cool keith that's the worst <laughs> i've ever done that's, that's a criminal like i almost want Wyatt to bleep that but no let that stay let that stand but um but no, like mantled and dented. But uh, even when I did not rate Esquire's verse on the same level as Danny's or Despot's, which, by the way, Despot's verse is ridiculous. And that's like, you now maybe he might, since Jay Electronic has graced us with at least two mid ass albums, Despot, Despot, whatever, is probably the now lost great rapper without an album. And mm-hmm. yeah, and this, this verse is, and the video too, where he's throwing the lucky charms. Go, mm. go, go fetch the man of the year a goddamn chair 
Like I'm not, I swear I will not just do verses from the song. I swear I'll try. <laughs> Especially I will not do the Danny Brown voice. Those who've listened to the Triple X episode have heard both me and Sphinx do a bunch of stuff in the Danny Brown voice. And you will hear me do at least one line in this episode of the Danny Brown voice. So I'm not going to do it too much. But um, there's one line, again, I'm digressing. But yeah, it came out in 2011 and famously watched the throne album about two dudes really lo- loving money, loving life. And there's one line on here from Squire, fuck the throne, watch the project bench covered in pigeon shit. Like that yep. line hit me so goddamn hard. I'm like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then still lost is holding Caulfield is catcher in the rye, which is a deep, like, you know, really good depressed ass line. And then like we were saying about Jeff's position, he comes up with some dirty ass shit right afterwards. Fuck a smut, try and catch her in the eye. Like, and mm. I think that, yeah, this ver- this song sold me essentially forever that he was at least interesting. I might not check for everything he does, but anybody who could get mm. this group of artists together, get this type of work out of them, is somebody mm. to check for. Mm. Well, one thing as well, which I, I quite like about the video is um, the way that Esquire is like uh, dressed. It's based on, do you know who Just Ice is, the 80s rapper? I'm aware, yeah. Yeah, so he's he's... Recreating like a, a just ice, that um, yeah, a just ice like I don't know um, look, um, and it's just I don't know. It's, I, I find it really cool that he did a throwback to like an '80s rapper because just ice. If you kind of read about the dude, um, he was saying some really dirty shit as well, like you know, in the late '80s, early '90s. Um, and <laughs> there used to be this really, really, really funny interview on this um, website called Uncut. Uh, yeah. And it was one of the funniest interviews. This dude just went off. So I, I don't know. I just find it really cool that he kind of had that throwback as well. And that's something that maybe, I don't know, that might be something that, because he doesn't like the song because I guess in a way it's overshadowed a lot of the other shit that he's done. And I feel like people not kind of recognizing that he's kind of expressing this uh, direct influence on the song as well is, is something that's really cool in that, you know, so. I mean, the, re- the song Randy itself Burton. is, like, very meta in a lot of ways. Like, it starts with, like, a reference to Craig Max later in the year with, like, you know, we do the, we got to do the remix, right? Take yeah, that, yeah. Take that, take that. <laughs> yeah, and then every every verse references back to Huzzah, which on Lost mm-hmm. in Translation, which I swear to God will get back to the actual tape. Like, everything mm-hmm. calls back to X Squire's verse, the drunk driving on a Wednesday, and, like, you know, three shots of blank. And then they all riff off of that in an old school remix style, which is really cool to see people going back. I mean, damn, it's cool to see people up on it. Damn, it's cool to see like rappers all going back to this old school remix style, not just like going over a cut and paste like a beat, like the roll 110 deep or whatever, like where they're just doing eight bars cut and paste. Like everybody seems invested in this. They all showed up for the video. Even Killer Mike shows up for the video and he doesn't even have a verse. He just yeah, stands yeah. in the back while LP smokes a cigarette and counts down. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. It's it's so good. Uh, Another I, thing I, as well. So um, the beat itself is, is from an old Necro song. Um, are you aware that it's a sample from a porno? I mean, I feel like most Necro beats are probably samples <laughs> from pornos. <laughs> but like, it's a very strange sample. So it must have been a pretty, you know, pretty old porno. Um, just uh, I don't I'm know. Sure the both Squire saw it at some point. Like, I'm sure that's <laughs> where they bonded over. Uh, it also <laughs> makes sense with what Esquire is doing in the video, too. <laughs> yes, 100%. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I... This song is... I'm trying to think of any other posse cuts that really match up to it from the 2010s. Um, no one's ever really... Do you know Frozen Sunlight with um, Open Mike Eagle, Billy Woods, and Mark Specht at all? I always, is that I've one of the, like, the kind of CGI music video? I don't know if he even had a music video, um, oh, okay. but because I only ever found it on SoundCloud and it, it got pulled off YouTube a bunch of times. I don't know why, oh, okay. but it's got like the only thing I can really think to mention it is the Blast Billy Woods line on the song is so when my thumb points down is pity, not hatred, which is like the most cold ass line I can think of the end of her <laughs> like talking about killing people. Um, I wish I could remember any of the Mike Eagle punchlines off the top of my head because they're hilarious. That's up mm. there. And there's also frozen sunlight. Um, not Frozen Sunlight 2, um, Full Spectrum 2, Lauren's remix, uh, which is, again, Mike Eagle, Zilla Rocca, and I want to say Curly Castro. That's also up there. But, like, in terms of songs oh, like we heard, this is probably, yeah, right. like, the posse cut that's, like, best. Um, 
it's and it came at the beginning of the decade. I think it really defined a scene. Something I want to talk about more in this episode yeah, is yeah. how how the fuck did Esquire get signed? And it, what it reminds me of mm -hmm. is you might be a little young for this, but in the nine and I'm gonna come across like a mad old head, whatever. But in the nineties, so there was this band, this guy. Kurt Cobain, K-R-U-D-T, uh, Nirvana, like they got popular. So then they decided these these ARs to sign any band from this area yeah. that sounded any kind of way like them. And mm -hmm. so I feel like Odd Future got popular in the early 2000s. Yeah. So it was like, let's sign all these weird rappers. And then we yeah. have no idea what to do with them. And some of yeah. them kind of worked out. Like you have your ASAP, ASAP Rocky worked out. But then you have your Mr. Motherfucking Esquire and Universal Science him. And then you have this dude who's like, here's 15 songs about 90s pro wrestling and me having graphic sex. Well, you How know what is kind of interesting about that, though, is like, I mean, Action Bronson was signed to a major at one point, right? He Was was he on Vice Records, which I uh, guess is more yeah, he was on major. Vice, which was definitely uh, Vi Noisy, which was Vice's like imprint or whatever, yeah. which I'm sure was like, uh, you know, they positive themselves as like an edgy alternative but you know vice was murdoch media so obviously that was not like a mind like an indie by any means yeah. and um i know that uh mr wonderful was his uh major label debut fairly weird for a major label debut but yeah well, and it worked out fairly well for bronson but in a different i way, mean is, is it that much different because all bronson well not all he writes about but what he's known for rapping about is fucking you know prostitutes and food so is it really that much different to esquire being signed i guess the main difference is esquire's got motherfucking in his name <laughs> i mean that that is very true but i think what bronson does differently is that i mean there there's one major difference that we could talk about is that he's not only white he's like the whitest white he's like albanian like albino white, like albanian whatever i mean like i think it's well i gotta step i guess by. as well he's got his other personality of being effectively a celebrity chef at this point I was so say, that, was that, like, yeah i mean aside from the racial aspect of it he also has the gimmick of he's a celebrity chef and i think he was able to parlay that and he was on vice so he had the show on vice and mm. i think that like in addition like I mean, there's a direct through line from that eventually. You have Brock Hampton. They also had a show on Viceland. Like, mm. So I think that if you had like a side hustle where you could rap and do something else, you could put out a right. little rap record. But if yeah. you had a show, you could be like a hyphenate. You could something like that. But your rap record was something you got to do. It wasn't your primary thing. Esquire wasn't putting out like a show. No, he was on uh, Eric Andre once, and that's it. <laughs> wait, wait, where? When was on Eric Andre? What, what, I've seen everything except season five. When it might be like it? season one or two. It's like you know how they at the end of an episode they'll have like a yeah they a have guest. the performance. Yeah, I he performs something. I can't remember what happens, but I'm pretty sure he's performing for sure. <laughs> I will. Uh, I mean, it's easy to forget what happens to Eric Andre. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will have to re I'll have to rewatch that. I remember on. One of my favorite Eric Andre performances was when uh, John Wayne does a uh, acoustic sampler performance. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Or um, Henry Rollins doing a um, spoken word bit about frozen yogurt. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Man. It's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, we can't go down the road of me just talking about Eric Andre. This will be five hours long. I, it really will be. Um, my my dream guest for the show is Kraft Punk. Oh yeah, of course. Hey guys, it's me. <laughs> everyone is friends with everyone. <laughs> Did you know I cannot die? <laughs> Please leave. Oh my god! Oh, there, there's one other Adult Swim reference that we're eventually going to get to that you made recently that I I will not be able to contain myself with the joy about because I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure I'm sure this man has reviewed one Esquire album. He's rated all of them because he's heard everything. Yeah, he, he's rated the ones that he clearly didn't listen to because he got. Um, well, you haven't heard it because it's not li not live to the public yet. But um, wherever you're, uh, you're in New Zealand, um, yeah. right? Correct. Yeah. Um, do you guys have Soylent bars there? What are they? Like Okay, Soylent bars are something some uh tech bro asshole came up with where it's like, you know, eating that thing you have to do to live. What yeah. if you got to take away all the enjoyable stuff about that and just make it in bar form where it's just like you get your breakfast, lunch, and dinner in like a bar with like all the nutrients, like uh, right. Yeah, yeah. 
So that guy that we're going to talk about, he like has music consumption in that way. He's like a Soylent music <laughs> listener. <laughs> so, that is his approach to listening to music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's he doesn't wicked. Even he finished a song fall. before he's like got an opinion on the album. It's Soylent mm. music listening. <laughs> I just love the whole thing where it's like I'll hear one line in the song and then assume the entire song is about that one line and it clearly just isn't. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, most of the time the hook, but sometimes a baffling line in the verse where it's like, yeah, so just like a random listen to the verse sometime, which is like, why? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to it. I mean, eventually I'll find some way to shoehorn in what you said because it's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. But if he hasn't <laughs> reviewed it, because I, I'm thinking x might be a little too under the radar for him to actually have devoted his precious time to. But anyway, well, lost in translation. I think that we're going to be lost in translation if we don't actually start talking about this tape. So, yeah. um, so probably uh, and one thing to mention, have you like read about the backstory behind this tape? Not really. It's on Mishko, which is something I, I also want to talk about this label because when I was trying, what I was trying to get to when I was talking about Nirvana and A&R signing everybody is I think, and you mentioned Action Bronson, uh, these guys put out like something by Mayhem Loran. And they, I think, um, well, these, they didn't put out anything by Danny Brown, but these guys, and oddly enough, Scion AV, um, who are a car company, but had like a weird arm that put out like, like uh, I guess promotional stuff by rap artists. They put out like Danny, Br- like oddly clean stuff, including a clean EP by Danny Brown. Danny Brown's a uh, grown-up single, one of the best singles of all time, by the way. Um, they put out stuff like that, like in the early 2010s. Like they were a fashion label that was kind of. Maybe it was just because it was cool, I guess, just putting mm. out this type of stuff. And I think that that was like emblematic of the whole odd future. Like, I guess it's fashionable to put out shit by weirdos, which is, I guess, mm. goes back to the through line that I keep trying to establish on this podcast, where it's like we started with Keith, then Doom kind of solidified it, made it fashionable. Mm. And we've arrived here with Odd Future and now guys like X Squire, ASAP Rock, ASAP. I could butcher this a lot harder, couldn't I? ASAP Rocky. And, you know, Action Bronson are getting signed. And so mm. now somebody's like, X Squire gets to put something like this out with songs like Michael, named it from Michael Dudikoff, something mm. as weird as fuck with Maltese Falcon, which shows off his insane storytelling skills. Seven mm-hmm. minute songs like Cockney, Cockney Sandwich <laughs> slash yeah. Piss in Between Train Cars. Although yeah. it's really a five minute song with a skit, that type of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, my whole thing is like, this wouldn't have come out even five years prior. Like something, there was a sea change. Mm. And anyway, so that's kind of the point I was trying to get to. I don't think I got to it very well, but what is the backstory? Maybe that'll help. So just, I'm just on this, a band came article about this. I'm just going to quote what he said here. He said, I made this, made that album after I had a bad week where I tried to kill myself. My roommate caught me in shit. Then my grandmother had a stroke. I caught my girlfriend cheating on me with some dude. Me and the dude fought and then I got fired from my job. So that's what this album is about. Um, so... <laughs> yeah, I can hear that. He had many reasons to not give a fuck, and that clearly comes across in like a lot of the shit that he's rapping about on this album because he's pretty reckless, you know. Yeah, I would say like he comes like huzzah especially, and it's like when he's asked what huzzah is about, it's like I'm fucking drunk. <laughs> oh good shit! Like yeah, that's, that's what this is about. Maltese Falcon is just him like being high as fuck and kind of just coming up with as many wild themes from his imagination as childhood and threading them together. And then, mm-hmm. like, something like Build a Bitch is clearly a reaction to his girlfriend cheating on him. And, and it's over the pigeon instrumental for the first half. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking strange. And then, no and comment, of course, it's clearly a reaction to the stroke, too. Like, he. Yeah. And also, like, already, in terms of just being a fully formed artist, like Danny Brown, in terms of putting a lot of thought into album structuring, like, even mm. something that's as rawly emotional as a reaction. This is constructed very deliberately. Yeah. I mean, as, as well, like, just to kind of go back to how reckless he was, you know, he <laughs> he did a song about chicken, fried chicken, on over the vein instrumental as well. And it's like the instrumental with all the ad libs on it, too. <laughs> like, all the, yo, yo, you know, all that kind of shit going on. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of like, fuck it, man, I'll do whatever. And, like, I mean, obviously he put thought into these things, but... Yeah, and, 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 and like, as you're mentioning as well, um, on Cockney Sandwich, there's a skit where it's just him getting a fucking blowy. It's like, I don't really want to hear this, but when, when it's happening, he's like, maybe I should record this. Like, you, you hear him saying that, and then you, you know, have fucking two minutes of him getting slobbed off. So, like, 
Just, just I mean, absolute reckless no, no, I, lifestyle. I skipped skip that. I mean, I skipped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I, I was like, I, I I'm like, oh, this is this is why this song is seven minutes, and I feel like that's kind of why I had a bit of less of opinion when I first heard it. Was I was like, okay, this is a bit of a gimmick. <laughs> And at the time, it felt like that was my one issue with it, where I was like, we're signing all the weirdos and everybody who's going to be like Tyler. And it was kind of why I've gone into this on the show before. I had a bit of a negative opinion of Tyler before because it was like, what's going to get me attention on the Internet? What's going to get me like smoking section buzz or positive, negative or otherwise? Like, you know, Lil B got big because love him or hate him, he everybody was talking about him so I could do five minutes of nonsense, whether or not what yeah. Lil B was doing was nonsense. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. And so it's easy to group everybody who was popular on the internet at that time in that basket. And so I think when I heard this at first, I kind of grouped it in that. Like, right. even though it came out on Mishka, it wasn't as, even though he's technically just as good as someone like Mayhem Loren, he's mm. different subject matter, different approach. And if you're in the wrong type of mood, wrong type of mindset, not familiar with what, like, I mean, it helped that I came into this for this re-listen after having listened to a lot of his more recent stuff, which mm -hmm. establishes that he's still the same guy now. Mm -hmm. essentially. This is just a lot rawer in terms of, like you said, he was reacting to events in his life and he didn't give a yeah. fuck. Yeah. So. Another thing with one guy as well. Just one more point. Um, when you get to the sex addict tape or something like that, that's also a reaction, but it's like, he had a lot more time. Like, you know, this is like, I'm going to shoot my shot. People are have eyes on this type of stuff. Whereas the industry left him behind by the time he put out like confessions of a sex addict, mm. he's the same artist, but he has like, no one's looking at him. Mm. He's still putting out like, I want to say shock value bars, but like still like, you know, stuff that would be jarring to your average listener. Right. And, but he's constructing it in a more careful way, I guess. Whereas this feels a little more raw-nerved. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Another thing as well about this tape is like you've got to, you know, you've got to give them credit because no one was really on the mix safe circuit was rapping over old LP beats or necro beats or fucking esoteric beats. Like no one was doing that shit. And I, I kind of look at it in the way where like he kind of bridges the gap between just like just enough like kind of hardcore you know street shit and then the kind of the more like quote-unquote nerd rap kind of def jux kind of stuff as well so that, that's something i find really compelling about him too is, is that he can do that and it's just like he takes in all of these influences from completely different spectrums of the genre and makes his own kind of persona from that you know um well you talk about production who is Charlie Brown Beats? I'm actually going to click on him now on RYM. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I, I think he produced a song for Evidence with um, Prodigy and Rock Mask, which is a fucking banger, but I don't really know what else he's, he's done. He might have just been a kind of short-lived producer. He was on, speaking of Theodore Unit, a uh, trite diesel solo album that no one has oh, okay. for rated. Um, hmm. He was on Tony Touch's uh, Peacemaker 3, which has a terrible Eminem <laughs> verse where he uses the letter H a bunch. Um, he was on a uh, friend of the show Logic's Young Sinatra, which I have not heard and or will hear. Um, on here, he has one song that is essentially... Um, if you, have you heard Jake One's white band music at all? Uh, songs from it here and there, but not the whole thing. Um, you probably haven't heard Soil Raps, because it's one of the hyphy tracks. Um, I think uh, one of his tracks on here is literally the beat from Soil Raps. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it, the Soil Raps. Soil, I'm not, I'm not going to do a hyphy voice. It's even worse than my Danny Brown voice. But yeah... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that makes me think that maybe it's a pseudonym for somebody just stealing shit. Because there was other mm. something else on here that was like very like a dill. I don't know, but I mean, all his beats on here are great. So it mm -hmm. might have also just been like a parallel thought thing where he had the same sample loop as Jake One. I don't know. It sounds very similar to Slow Raps. But mm. yeah, this is great. I recommend it to anybody who hasn't heard it. It's long. It's pushing seventy minutes, but mm. there's no bad songs on here and. No. As far as like the harsher like sexual material goes, it's not as harsh as stuff he would do in the future. Um, I think so. I think it makes a good entry point, you know, no pun intended in that way. Um, if you can take this, you know, if he can dodge a wrench, he can dodge a ball. If you can take this type of X Squire sexual material, then you're probably good for the rest of it. Like it, it eases you in again, no pun intended. I gotta stop this. Um, <laughs> 
But yeah, and like you- seriously though, like it's I think he's feeling it out. I swear to God, I'm not trying to do this. Like it's definitely to use a wrestling term, a feeling out process for what he can get away with in terms of rapping about sex. It's not right. just the cool Keith porno core sort of thing where it's battle rap, but about, you know, fucking your bitch or yes. fucking your bitch. Like he's actually exploring the topic and seeing how much he can make that appealing musically. And eventually he's well, going to so push that very far. And eventually he's going to try and sing too. And that's going to have yes. diminish Like, you know, it's going to hit and miss. But I appreciate the artistic ambition. Hmm. I mean, he sings on... He doesn't try and sing here. He does. On Nothing Even Matters, he sings on the the chorus for that. Uh, Oh, you're right. You're right. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But but also, with all the, you know, the sexual content, the thing, it it just, it sounds convincing, though. You know, it's not like he's trying to, like, overcompensate or anything like that. I I feel like these are probably actual things that, you know, has happened because he's just... I think that's a very good point to make, actually, (laughs) is that like, and I think this is true of Danny as well, even though, like, Danny brags a lot. And, I mean, X-Fire brags a lot, I guess, but they're both, like... And if you go back to our Triple X episode, the end of I Will is pop a pill because I can't feel. Like, in both their cases, they're, like, talking about sex in all aspects of it. Like, they fuck a lot, but it's to compensate for something else. Mm. They fuck a lot because there's other... Sh- like, it's not just, like, I fuck bitches. It's not, like, Lil B, I fuck bitches, dog, I fuck bitches. And even mm. in Lil B's case, that's, like, a joke. But it's not, like... <sighs> I'm trying to think of a rapper who... Like, your general rapper, just, like, I have a song about I'm fucking a lot of hot bitches. That's like, it's all what your ass over. <laughs> over. So, what, what, I'm sorry, I missed that. I was just going to say, like, you know, maybe something off, like, The Chronicle or something, like, a you know, one of those kind of Paul Sopono, Dr. Oh, Dre yeah, kind of... Yeah, like, yeah, like, come on. <laughs> like, literally, I pause to just have a sound. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, so yeah, who like, else? Uh, Ready to die, like literal little mm. Kim giving me a blowjob on audio. The, the, the worst one of all time is on Big Pun's Capital Punishment. There's a sketch called Taster's Choice, and it's like, I do not want to oh, hear I... fighting over this morbidly obese man's penis. Like, <laughs> cut that shit out. <laughs> The thing is, right, I, I never I never really delete songs if I don't like them, but that's one time where I'm like, I, I don't want this on my fucking, I'm, you know, I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah, Jordan. Um, <laughs> another person, we'll get to him, actually. He actually has a feature. You wouldn't expect that he has a feature on an Esquire album, but uh, The Game, uh, he has a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, songs like this that are just unfortunate sex songs, like on albums that otherwise have nothing to do with sex, just one song. Yeah, that's the motherfucking game! And it's like, he'll be like, <laughs> Uh, there, there's one about um, on Documentary 2, which is otherwise a pretty good album you wouldn't expect, but it's like about how much he fucks bitches while he hates bitches, and he rhymes mm-hmm. like burpees with herpes and stuff, and it's just like, what are you doing? Why do we need this? And <laughs> But yeah, no, when x r- raps about sex, like you might find it tiresome or uncomfortable, or but it's not like, it's not solely hollow braggadocio. There's yeah. something else to it in terms of context and his personality and what he's trying to get across. Something that's not, maybe not even necessarily for the listener. Mm. And also, like, I mean, you, when you do get that, you also get some very, like, heartfelt kind of, you know, nice songs like I Should Be Sleeping, which is about him getting up at night and his mum, you know, saying good night to him. <laughs> Right. I, I feel like there's, yeah, like it's not just misogyny and it's not just bragging. Like you get mm. misogyny and you get bragging. Like, mm. I mean, he's been like, he, he breaks up with women. He's pissed off at them. He fucks mm. women. He's proud of it. Like, yeah, he's mm. a complicated, he's a complex person and he does shitty things. Mm-hmm. So, and he's going to own that, but it's not just one dimensional monochrome subject matter either. I'm not saying it always makes for songs that I'm going to repeat. Like, I'm not going to ride for all of these songs, but I think that he does a good job of sketching a three-dimensional personality throughout yeah. his discography. Yes, yeah, so it's like it's a, a respectable approach to it, I think. And, um, yeah. Also, I just want to shout out No Time, because he goes off on that fucking song. Good, good Lord. <laughs> well, goes, I mean, there's a thread throughout his discography where, and he shares this with Danny as well, where... He knows that bookending a project is important. And he mm. always leads off strong and ends strong. And 
sometimes it's the mat like often thematically consistent but sometimes just in the sense of just i gotta rap hard to begin i gotta rap hard to leave you with something to remember but most mm. of the time it really is thematically consistent because again sharing that with danny i think that he pretty much goes into every project that's a project that's not something like the big fat kill where it's just like i'm rapping to rap and mm. most of the projects are concept projects although mm. power and passion is the next one right I believe. I think so, yeah. I think that's the next in the kind of chronological order of things, yeah. Yeah, and so Power and Passion is something that I would say is doesn't really have a concept. I mean, it's... Yeah. I don't yes know. And no. Yes and no. I mean, like, it alludes to a concept. Hmm. Uh, it's not my favorite thing it has. It has some, like, the message part one and two, especially the little break in it, where hmm. it's like they're trying to silence my message, and it has, like, the little white noise fade out, and he comes back in, and that's great. Um, and I like the Gucci song on it and there's nothing bad. Okay. What I'll say about this and I did put my, put my review up. So, you know, people will probably know what I've heard about this. If you're one of the five people listening to this, who's also read the review is, um, it can't live up to the production credits. If you look at these production credits, I'll read them off. Crazy. Not the genius, <laughs> Harry fraud, space ghost, perp, blue sky, black death, LP. The fuck. He got Gucci main on an LP beat. And he got Gucci Man on an LPB. Gucci Man. Yeah. And Gucci Man raps about Hamburger Helper. And it's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah this, this is gonna... another uh, precursor of an upcoming episode. Shout out to Sophia. February is coming up soon. Winter is coming. So you're about to listen to eight hours of us talking about Gucci. Nice. Get ready. Yeah. Get ready. Only eight hours? <laughs> I mean, well, we're most okay. The way we have that episode set up is she's going to talk about every album and we're going to stop for the ones that we've all heard that are relevant. She's heard literally every album. Wow. Literally every album, mixtape, every scrap that Gucci has put out. Jesus. She's heard. Christmas. She's nuts. She's a fucking psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> and we love her. Shout out to friend of the show, Sophia, future guest, Sophia. Yep. We've been waiting to have her on for a long time. We've been waiting the Gucci episode for a long time because we have not found anybody crazy enough to listen yeah. to every single scrap of Gucci music until Sophia. But we're, yeah, but yeah, Telefuck is one of those Gucci features, kind of like uh, Poltergeist with Talib Kweli, or he'll do this all the time because Gucci's a nerd. Like, who else has Gucci done like these weird, like, not Gucci features with? Uh, Sean Block is a big boy. Does that count? <laughs> Um, Jake Paul. <laughs> oh yeah, well. <laughs> Shout out to the Jake Paulers, man. <laughs> mm. Oh Jesus. God, I hate that so much. I hate it so much. Um, although Jake Paul did try and pressure Dana White into giving health insurance to UFC fighters, so That's kind of reasonable. Jake Paul? Question mark. <laughs> um, this is all right. Um, this is good. I mean, it's pretty good. I do. Ex- I don't know. It's. For this production roster, given what Esquire's done with other people's borrowed production and stuff, and having heard future stuff, I do expect a little more. Like, him on a Harry Fraud beat, like, Harry Fraud has had much worse rappers do better. I will say that. I personally feel like the Harry Fraud beat was good, but not one of his better beats. But maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, it's... That's the thing about Harry Fraud beats. Even a mid-Harry Fraud beat's going to be good. And the thing is, this is also when he was, like, putting out a thousand beats and giving them to, yeah. like, everyone. So yeah. I don't even know if he knew where they were going at this point. Mm. So um, the message part one and two is my favorite thing on here, aside from the Gucci verse. And I this is, the, I think, the first thing he put out on Universal, I believe. Yeah, I think, yeah, it says Universal Republic on the RYM page. So, yeah. So I think that's both interesting and admirable that he took his, like, major label budget and use it to get Gucci rapping about hamburger helper and this production mm. master. But yeah, I, I, I feel like this is a weird one because it's, it's kind of a lot of it is like quote unquote turn up music, but it's also got that kind of psychedelic edge to it as well. <clears throat> so as you'll probably, you can kind of see throughout his career is he's not like an East coast, East coast, you know, um, dude, he, he will, put his foot into kind of trap music or like cloud rap as well here and there. So this is kind of, I don't know. It seems like a weird take on trap music. A lot of it, um, even though it does have like blue sky, black death on it. And that's what I think at least anyway. Um, I don't know. Interesting take this one. Um, it's definitely a completely different direction as well. If you think about it from, um, 
the previous one. Mixed yeah, tape. no, it's different in some way. Like, it's different. He's trying different stuff. I think he's feeling out what he can do with his budget. I think, mm. obviously, the LP stuff shows where... Well, I mean, first of all, it shows L's, like, L's interest in him. I think L's probably the one who got him the deal, more or less. Yeah, I don't know. Possibly. That would make sense. I mean, yeah, because I think it was, like, you said the Rubble King stuff, and also he used all those L beats, and L was on Last Huzzah. And I think L probably with the Adult Swim William Street connection, I think. Mm. Yeah, that would um, make sense. <laughs> but yeah, this overall, I think, is aside from the curiosity of Telefuck, and I think the message part one and two is one of his better songs. This is one of his letter, least essential ones. It's still fun, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I don't think he has any bad projects, but this one does less for me than a lot of his other stuff. I think the instrumentals, it just promises something more interesting than it delivers to a degree. Okay. Yeah, that's, 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 that's fair. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I've just, I just realized as well, um, I don't think you listened to it, but in between this was um, Mary Xmas and Suck My Dick 1. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Which, uh, yeah. I managed to get a listen to today, uh, which is just kind of more in the vein of... Um, oh, this has a Danny... Okay, well, I mean, I'm interested yeah. at the very least to hear about the uh, Danny verse song. Well, it has two things. Um, Danny's on here. I want to hear about Danny on Killer Tofu. Which mm -hmm. great, great, um, great title. Also, song about the Rocketeer again, talking about my childhood and just references that just fucking resonate with me. Even though I'm guessing the Gold Watch, please tell me the Gold Watch has a sample of Christopher Walken from Pulp Fiction. I don't, I can't remember. Maybe uh, <laughs> like where he talks about. You know what speech I'm talking? Yeah, about, yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. I just can't remember. I just kind of skimmed through this today. Oh, uh, oh fuck! It has a Troy Av feature. Yeah, it's got Troy Av. And it's also like um, another dude I don't who shit on the Matthew Ragazzino feature because this was a yeah. dude who was like, um, he, when I was talking about Mishka, he was a dude who was showing up on all this stuff. He was like riff raff. Yeah. He was like a culture vulture ass dude who I didn't really like. So. I mean, I'm not really super mad that I missed this looking at it, um, but maybe you'll tell me I missed a classic. I don't know. Uh, it's pretty good. Like, um, yeah, the, the Troy Ad song is just a Troy Ad song. It's not really like he's on it, but it's more in what the song. The thing about Troy Ab is that he's Troy Average. Like, he's an average rapper who just did dipshit stuff in real life that made him objectionable. As a rapper, he's just filled in space. Well, he was like kind of marketed as like a um, as a savior of New York, which is just fucking bizarre. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's the most mid rapper I can think of. Like the one performance <laughs> I can think of that he got on a um, any um, release of note was uh, Pusha T's "Wrath of Cain," I believe it was. It was a um, Rove Runner with um, a Harry Fraud beat, which it's like, mm. well, it's a Pusha T song with a Harry Fraud beat. How bad could it be? And you're mm. on it, and you don't ruin it. Congratulations. I mean, Riff Raff would have ruined it, so you're better than Riff Raff. That mm. is an extremely low bar. So, <laughs> so beyond that, yeah, I mean, like, I never saw it. And then he did a diss song on uh, Capital Steez dissing him for committing suicide. Yeah, yeah. So just nice. fuck yourself forever. Just fuck yourself forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's pretty much my stance. That, that is the podcast stance on Troy Apps. He can fuck himself forever. Uh, the Danny track? Yeah. Sorry? How is the Danny track? That's good. Yeah. Um, I, it must have been... Because they've probably got, what, like... I wonder how many songs they appear on together. It's probably over five or six, right? Yeah, they... Um, I mean, uh, Tomorrow's Gone, Last is Ah, this one... Oh, Hail No. Oh, Hail No. Which, unfortunately, I've heard a bunch, but I've not re-listened to... I mainly remember Danny closes out with I'm Ric Flair with thick hair. Um, <laughs> what I remember. Um, God, I promise people so, too, not too much Danny voice. I'm already breaking that promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's four. Yeah, they've had a few. I mean, like, uh, enough enough for an age, age, right? yeah, we just owe you a coat. Um, there's, a, there's, there's another song here, Two Twenty Twos, which is him doing his version of the Jay Z song, not over the same beat, but it's the same kind of concept. Uh, and then there's another song in there called Power You Part Two, which is like a weird up tempo, almost like dancey type song, which is pretty interesting. 
Um, but yeah, if you want like more stuff like Lost in Translation, but maybe not as focused, it's, it's a good listen. It's clearly, I mean, it makes sense. It's just like, you know, it's Christmas. Here, have this tape. You know, here's a whole bunch of shit on it. Enjoy. Well, kind of. When we get to part three, um, part three, I didn't think was very, aside from the front and back, very Christmassy. Is this like... <laughs> The same way where it's like not particularly no, it's, Christmassy. It's there's just there's not, I don't think there's anything on here about Christmas. It's just like <laughs> Christmas time, you know? So, cheers. Thanks, Mr. Lyle. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really trying to hear rapping about Christmas if it isn't Christmas in Harlem or Dipset uh, or Dipset's uh, Ballin' for a Christmas uh, RIP stack bundles. Max B. So, yeah, like that's really my, the extent of the time I'm trying to hear rapping about Christmas. So, yeah, fair. Cool. Um, so, bad. yeah. Had a really terrible Christmas again. If, podcast listeners will have listened to the last two episodes you'll know i had a real shit christmas so let's just move on uh merry christmas and suck my dick move on um <laughs> so now it is uh, it's the man in the high castle i guess man in the high castle which has nothing to do with hitler all that uh, does this have there was one great line he no it's not on this one um actually wait uh what's the fucking line um what was was the line where he had about um you know Hitler, but name a couple slave owners. Was that on this one, or was that on oh, um, uh, Lost in Translation? Because that's a great line. And oh, it was on uh, the Combat uh, R.I.P. Combat Jack, which is on. No, nah, that's on Xmas Three. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I just skipped way ahead yeah. on that. I just wanted to make a Hitler reference because Man in the High Castle, but no, there's nothing on this. Actually, has nothing to do with the title. I, I think it's just supposed to be a reference to him, like smoking weed. I think. Um, I don't, and you know, shout out to the cover art, uh, great, see, um, you know, Windows 98, uh, computer game cover art that he's got going on here. <laughs> yeah. But, um, this I had, good. this is good. Recently. It's not like super high end X Squire, but I enjoyed it. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Fun type. It's got some really funny shit on there. Fucking your mama is like just <laughs> outrageous. Um, he rats over an Alicia Keys song with Unthinkable, which is Pretty interesting. Um, very mixtapey, where you just like leave the rest of the song to play out, even though you clearly did not collaborate for this person. Um, there's a really good storytelling track on Pussy Times Three, where about him getting beaten up by like a record producer woman and then ending up in a wheelchair, which I thought was pretty creative. Um, yeah, I think his um, narrative tracks are always really good. Like he. Uh, okay. I think his best one will probably come up on Live Forever, actually. But yeah, he has a really like vivid imagination and really good mm -hmm. imagery that he uses in tracks. And a lot of times he'll just use that to talk about sex. But I think that he has a gift for just in general coming up with images that stick with you. So yeah, for sure. I think that this one's it's mixtapey for sure. But yeah. it's a mixtape from somebody who has like. More like it's a mixtape in a different way than the Big Fat Kill is a mixtape. Like the Big Fat Kill is a mixtape where it's just like I'm gonna take these great beats and rap well over them. This is like somebody with a personality rapping over beats you wouldn't expect in a way that has something different to say. Yeah, like there's that song um, "Punch." Is it "Punch Clock Blues" about uh, having a shitty job? And the first yeah. verse is about yeah, his kind boss of like kind of giving him a warning. And the second verse is him, like, getting in a fight with someone who works there, I think. And it's, you know, yeah, very good narratives. Also quite relatable shit if you've ever worked a shitty job. So, um, yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, Prince Quiet, Quiet, maybe a mind. sex addict. He's also the, the kind of everyman in that sense, too. So that's cool. Yeah, Punch Clock Blues will remind me a little bit of, like, a combination. It was like uh, Cameron's Get It No... Um, I Hate My Job. I was supposed to get it in Ohio. But that not really, like, get it in Ohio. It's like, I hate... Off the same album, though. Uh, I hate my job by Cameron, but like with kind of the absurdist sense of humor of somebody like maybe a big Spencer to go back to somebody I would make a comparison to, or even an open Mike Eagle. Like I think he has yeah, or on an open Mike Eagle actually, even though like Mike would never be as vulgar as X Squire is. I think they have the same sort of sense of imagination and the same reference base too. And I'm not even just talking about the wrestling stuff, although Debbie would definitely talk about wrestling for like hours and hours, but they also, I think have a lot in common in terms of just being able to take these weird, obscure, nerdy reference points and make them universe, like express emotion that they could like, I talked about this in the doom episode where it's like doom took these old television shows, these dorky reference points and used them to talk about shit. You couldn't otherwise talk about in rap. Like mm. when 
think about phasers on the Gator album. The last line nowadays it's amazing, raising young. Rule number one: keep your phasers on stun. He's talking about keeping your head on a swivel, raising a kid, but he uses this low culture Star Trek reference point to talk about it. And what other rappers right. are fucking talking about Star Trek mm. over this like dusty ass, like you know, fuzzy sample? And it sounds gorgeous. And it's mm. like that's the sort of thing Doom would do all the time. And like X Choir can do that with like wrestling shit or yeah. like fucking like old movie shit or yeah, right. stuff. <laughs> yeah, or porn. Yeah, always yeah. porn. And Mike Eagle can do that with comic stuff I don't understand, or wrestling stuff I yeah. do, or so yeah. I feel like they share that in common, and and now you have a through line directly to that now with like I don't know ninety percent of the fucking popular rappers on the internet, and so I mm. see why you wanted to do the X Choir episode because like this should be where he's popular right now. He shouldn't have to charge twenty five dollars for his current mixtape to get people to pay fucking attention to him because he's mm. really doing a lot of the, he was doing a lot of the same shit that a lot of the most popular rappers are doing right now ten years ago. Better yeah. than that. Yeah. So and it's here multiple. it's like a little raw, a little more on form, but it's essentially just as good. He's always had a great ear for beats too. Hmm. Yeah, that's something I, I, I want to get into. I guess we'll kind of get into that when we get to Kisma. But um, yeah, his aesthetic is very interesting. And also, like, one thing I've, I've noticed as well is, is watching a lot of his, his videos and a lot of other, like, kind of stuff from this kind of 2010s era is so many music videos for these kind of dudes are filmed in, like, neon lit spaces. Have you noticed that? Like, right. the one for yeah. the wire and, like, pretty much all the Esquire videos, like heaps of them. So that was a very, like a very, uh, a, I guess like a trademark off the 2010s, which I've only really started to notice recently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess, is there anything else you want to say about this particular tape? Um, and it's good. It's a no, no, easy. It's, uh, yeah. I, I really don't have much else to say about this one specifically. Now we can move on from it if you like. Um, so does that bring us to Kismet, or is there something else in between? No, I think that's uh, it. Again, the RYM page not super helpful. I feel like I mean, he has features that were relevant, but I think we're just going to kind of hit the features in like a cluster right before we do his most recent release. Like, I figure we'll do all the features, then we'll do YOU at the very end is like the last thing because that's his most recent, and then we'll wrap up. So yeah, well, so yeah, he had features that were of interest at this point, but we'll skip them. So we'll just do Kismet now. And Kismet, I think, is probably his last big release between, I mean, he obviously had stuff, but uh, Kismet, I think, was like his most significant thing before his self-title. So. Mm. Yeah, this is where people really liked it and then forgot he existed <laughs> afterwards, for whatever reason. Um, I really like the atmosphere on this on this um, this particular release, and this is the first time where it's all uh, original production, right? I mean, there's a song where he just he raps over um, he raps over a Curtis Mayfield song, but the rest of it is all original beats. Well, I mean, there's a precedent established for that already. We like the Red Man Ghostface precedent, where you can pretty much just jack like a Delphonic song, or you can just do that. So yeah. it's established precedent. But yeah, and if you look at again, ear for beats, like who is he take? Like he didn't just decide like to call up. I don't even know who was fucking popular in 2013, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't Georgia Ann Muldrow and Kenyatta. No, but that's who he was calling up. And, yeah, and they are. A pretty strong relationship with Constro Buzz. I think that's like his most frequent collaborator on the kind of production to rapping tip. Um, yeah, yeah. I, and I th um, this has a, a great, great opening track too, where he's kind of just talking about what's going on in his life, and there's a line about him returning from tour and finding out yeah. his mum has cancer, and you know, so he's very personal. Um, in comparison to his other stuff, it's I think it's like slowed down quite a bit. Like it's kind of a drifting atmosphere, quite somber, um, yet still psychedelic kind of affair for this one. Um, would you agree with that? I think psychedelic is a good way to describe it. Um, I think that there, I feel like I, I wish I had more time to absorb this because I listened to it when around when it came out. I'm like, this is good. The Danny track is one of the best songs I've ever heard. And I've listened to the Danny track a hundred times. And then I'm like, everything else is good. Never really listened to it much beyond that. And I listened to it again. I'm like, this is really good, especially mm. with the context of the other stuff he was doing, but I didn't get a chance to listen to it again. And on Fort, okay, we'll get into this. There are two issues of this. There's this, and then there's the blue edition. 
And the blue edition has some interludes where he explains, I guess, his thought process or the... Yeah, it's like it's a Rita's commentary. (laughs) And there's a few bonus tracks on it that, unfortunately, I explained it to you. My life fell on my head, as it always does when I'm trying to do an episode or just when I'm trying to live my life. And um, there's a track with Chance the Rapper on here and also a Thundercrat track that is is listed as not produced by Thundercat, which I think is the funniest (laughs) thing ever. Featuring Thundercat, not produced by Thundercat, which makes me think he has like a fake Thundercat beat on there, which sounds hilarious. I'm more interested in what a Chance and uh, Esquire song sounds like. Honestly, not as bad as I was expecting. (laughs) Now, So what does it sound like, though? Like, is it like, I mean, Chance can adapt to a point, but I'm thinking like, I mean, Chance has rapped with Kanye. Kanye made All Mine, but Chance wasn't on All Mine. Like, Well, to to give you some context, like, yeah, as you mentioned, there are kind of skits or uh, like introductions to the songs on on the Blue Edition. And he explains the, the Chance one where he's like, it was my first time meeting Chance the Rapper and I had shown up to the studio. There was like a hundred people in the studio, people playing drums and I was high on mushrooms and we recorded the song. <laughs> I would have to be high on mushrooms to meet fucking Chance's church group when I'm trying to like, you know, well, I got some, I got all these like 64 Pornhub bars right now. <laughs> and Chance is like, well, I got my drum circle here and here's my wife. And <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is this is what have been coming off of acid rap, right? Where people didn't really turn on Chance. Now, for one, I have I, I haven't been able to stand that dude since he oh, started. No, acid rap sucks too, by the way. And I know <laughs> um, Caleb's gonna fucking like you know disagree with me on this, but I have been, and you can check my receipts on this on ROIM. I've never <laughs> liked Chance. Fuck nah, man. he sucks. Yeah. Annoying, annoying voice. Yeah, he he looks like the monobrow baby from The Simpsons. He just he just annoys me. <laughs> He looks like Gerald the Unibrow Baby from The Simpsons. I, I mean, I, I think he's like the rap Ned Flanders, personally. He's like yeah, the well, flavored elf ice milk. But, but honestly, uh, the, their song together, it's all right. You know, he, he, he does his kind of acid rap thing. He kind of raps some psychedelic images, and then Esquire does what he does. It's, and the, the beat's pretty good, too. I yeah, was expecting I mean, a lot. He's not an untalented person. Like he oh, no, for has sure. It's skill. Yeah. It's just he makes music I don't want to hear, and then it just got worse and worse. It's just funny to me how the big day happened, and it was just like everybody had this collective realization, and I'm just like, I was here years ago, guys. <laughs> I was here years ago, and y'all just got to the bus stop. Like, mm. where you been at? I mean, ugh. yeah, um, fuck Chance the Rapper. Um, Tomorrow's Gone, speaking of people who are the opposite of Chance the Rapper, everyone on Tomorrow's Gone. <laughs> um, uh, so, Another recurring theme on this show is me playing songs out of my car that make people mad that I should not be playing out of my car. Tomorrow's Gone Today was one of those songs. Yeah. Um, nice. I was coming back from the grocery store and uh, I um, had a car in front of me that was like Trump the fuck out, like Trump 2020, uh, fuck Joe Biden, this and that. And there was some yeah. car next to me with just people staring at me because I was playing, I guess, rap, indistinct rap music. And this song came on and Danny Brown rapped the line, y'all bitch pussy smell like anchovies. <laughs> I had to. I had to blare that shit. And I got so many dirty looks. And I'm sorry. I had to. Like, <sighs> yeah. Uh, Tomorrow's Gone is one of the best songs of all time. I, I don't know if I like it better than the Last is Our Remix, but the Last is Our Remix is iconic. But I think this is like its dark sister song, essentially. Like, yes, Last is Our Remix is like triumphant, and this one's defeatist. Like, you have mm. Nacho Picasso on here with probably my favorite Nacho Picasso performance because he really doesn't go very far for me because, like, a whole out. Al- He's been gifted with so many albums of perfect production, and his shtick is very much shtick. Like, it's yeah. very. Like, I forget who originally coined this. Like, shout out to friend of the show, Ivina. Ivanina, I believe. Or somebody coined, like, Lil B, but a complete asshole. And that's pretty much it. Like, that's what he does. And it gets a little tiresome over the course of a whole project. But for a feature verse, sometimes you can just hit the spot of him just doing that flow where he's just being a dickhead. And it fits there perfectly. And then you have Flatbush come in, all three of them, just Michi at first. And then it, it's just perfect layout. Like, it's not as perfectly rap or as iconic or even as good of a beat as the last Zob, but it just feels like a dark companion song to it. I fucking love Tomorrow's Gone. Uh, it's that's like, like, I think there's like a trilogy of that, Last Zob, and Cloudscape, main attractions of like the three best 
They're all Danny songs. They're all posse cuts. They're all fucking amazing. They would all offend the shit out of people I drive around on a daily basis. Mm. I love it. So. Yeah, Tomorrow's Gone, I feel, is like the posse cut of all the all the weird 2010s. Well, not all of them, but, you know, like a whole bunch of weirdo rappers from the 2010s. Well, who were popping off in the 2010s, I should say. Obviously, Danny Brown and Esquire have music before then, but... Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that song. Um, there's some lots of like really good shit on here. Um, uh, did, 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 let me have a look. Chains is really good. Um, Never Running Again, where he's you know talking about things that he's running from, running with this bullshit oh, and gun. Ends that really cool. Too. I love the way he ends that. He fades out. Yeah, it fades out. So cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, Paper Hearts. Hose, is, I, uh, Hose I don't remember. That's another like that's a song that you think is going to be really annoying that he like takes like again like that's the thing i say about him being like misogynist or offensive or whatever where it's like he is not that's the difference between him and like a wale or a drake where it's just like they're just like myopic and narcissistic and he's like myopic and narcissistic but not unself-aware about it like yeah he, actually on, on the blue edition that's one of the songs where it has an interlude before it and he's like the song it's called hoes i don't remember but it's about me being the hoe so you know he's saying men yeah. could be hoes exactly <laughs> It's, yeah. yeah, like that's the difference between him and a Danny and a Wale and a Drake, where those songs are ultimately about Wale and Drake just being narcissists, whereas songs like Danny and um, Esquire write about women like that are like, you know, they might be bragging, they might be talking about their exploits, but ultimately they're also including them, they're indicting themselves in it too. Yeah. Like, they're not unaware of their part in the shit, and they're not unaware of the damage they're doing mm. so and i think that that's important like mm. not that they're being like super conscious term paper rap about it not and that's what makes them fun is that again they're stand-up comedians and that's what mm. makes a good stand-up comic too mm. like it's just being yes, able to have that situational awareness mm-hmm. and i think yeah. that's what makes like something like drake or wale such a bummer is just having these songs about oh a bitch wronged me you dumb bitch and mm. song hook that's tedious mm. like you have mm. to have jokes you have to have a story you have to have characters you have to have like three dimensions mm-hmm. yeah for sure um this is the, as well like so obviously there's the whole thing on uh iym with uh esquire's page being a fucking mess with some things being listed as mixtapes others being listed as albums this is a mixtape, but I feel like it should be considered an album, though, right? Like, it's... Yeah, I mean... It's own... Yes and no. I mean, I feel like, ultimately, I go this way with the uh, type of typography or whatever about their... I mean, that's a whole other kettle of fish, and that's probably like the least appealing thing I could ever talk about, is how people write stuff and the arguments we have about it in RYM. But ultimately, it's my point about... The artist says that that should be concrete. And he says... Sure. Esquire's debut album is the self-titled. Therefore, That's a good his debut album is self-titled. It's mm. so, and I think he structures it that way too. Like he debuts, like his start off with "fuck boy," I'm a fuck boy. Like I mean, that's the sort of thing he would do. And I feel like <laughs> I get what you're saying. This is structured like an album, but so is Lost yeah. in Translation. Even if it has Jack Beats on it, even if it's it, so is Kiz. Like, yeah, like also, yeah, like. I'm sorry, I, I got Man in High Castle and Kismet mixed up when I was reading. But yeah, like Kismet, Man in High Castle, Lost in Translation are all structured like albums. But I think that by the 2010s fluid definition, they're, you could make a convincing argument they're mixtapes as well as albums. Like they're not mixtapes in terms of like Gangsta Grills type things where it's like they're all Jack Beats, but they're also not full fledged like all original production albums either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that's all fair. Um, do you consider this to be a cloud rap album? Mostly, yeah. 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 Um, maybe not like 100% like doppelgangers cloud rap type thing, but yeah, right. just, just because he raps so aggressively that it's not like a Shady Blaze Squad of B thing where he can fade into the background. Uh, right. But beyond that, I think a lot of the instrumentals are cloud rap. Certainly, the uh, Cherry Raindrops Vanilla Rainbow sequence is cloudy. Um, yeah, I feel like, for the most part, yeah, the instrumentals are cloudy. Tomorrow's Gone, I would consider to be like 
I put it right next to Cloud Skating, which I think is obviously a cloud rap song. Like, I think it's it fits. It has a cloud rap secondary. I would not be mm. mad at having a primary for it. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, I. The more I think about it, the more I would say yes. I don't think of him as a cloud rapper, but I. The more I look at this and think about it, I would say this is a cloud rap album more so than mm. anything else he's put out. Yes. And again, it's that thing where it's like he is so uh, he is so Brooklyn too, you know. Like, it, yeah, it might be mostly cloud rap, but he is unmistakably a dude who's from Brooklyn who's you know lived in a quite diverse, uh, hectic environment too, which always comes across in his, in his lyricism and his his. And I guess that's why he got discounted a little bit, or like painted with the hipster brush. Is, oh, he's from Brooklyn. He's doing this shit that only right. like, he's making like. Red and Stimpy punch lines, put some bread on your head like powdered toast, man. Like, oh, you know, I mean, first of all, that's a great fucking punchline. Fuck you if you don't like that punchline. Um, second of all, like, yeah, like he's just making clever punchlines. This is just shit that a certain audience would like. It's, mm. yeah, but nah, I, again, I feel like I'm kind of skirting a racial line here that I don't really want to have that discussion, but I feel like that's kind of. I don't know about the hipster rap thing. Like I kept mentioning riff raff and I feel like that was something that like that specific, like I think riff raff specifically, and I think there's a great Jeff Weiss piece. Um, by the way, this is completely jarring and out of place, but I do want to shout out the piece that Jeff Weiss put out like a day or two ago about uh, the murder of Draco that I think everybody should read because it's depressing as fuck, but essential because everything Weiss puts out is, but um, yeah, shout out to Jeff Weiss, one of the best writers we've ever had. But um yeah, I think riff raff around this time period really cut co- like that sort of rap colored people's impression of people like X Squire specifically. And I think Danny was in that bucket for a minute. Mm. And Danny just persisted so hard with such quality. And I'm not saying X Squire did it, but I think Danny was louder and got more of a boost like from outlets that X Squire didn't. I mean, X-Squire Danny- very well could have. Yeah. But- and I mean, he was, he was like. <laughs> He was in the news, not in the news, but I guess music pages were covering for other stuff outside of his music quite a bit as well, right? Like, I mean, there was the whole thing of him getting sucked off on stage with Danny Brown. And <laughs> so there's, right. there's that kind of aspect to it as well, whereas I guess his, his personality outside of his, his records was was an appeal to the public at least. Um, exactly. whereas, yeah. I guess X was more just like just, just rapping and that was kind of it. Um, keep this I mean, kind although of, if you listen to X Choir's uh, music, it's just as foul and filthy as Danny's. Oh yeah, no, Danny absolutely. was more willing to like expose himself, no pun intended, to <laughs> like just have the yeah. cameras there for that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So again, it's that Vice Land type thing, like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but I'm just more referring to like, and I was thinking about this today, and we kind of go into this in the Doom episode, and Sphinx of all people was like. Isn't rapping supposed to be about, like, you know, just making words sound nice? And then, because we were kind of talking about Mad Villain and how there was one criticism that people had where it's like, oh, it sounds nice, but he's not saying anything, which is, by the way, not true on Mad Villainy. But, like, and, like, Supreme Clientele, where it's sometimes true, sometimes isn't. But then it's like, there's this whole mindset, and from New York especially, where it's like, you rap about one thing and it's real rap, you rap about another thing and it's bullshit. And... Mm -hmm. Like, I think x does both. Like, he has real rap, but he also has rap that, you know, Big Ghost Limited might say is soft boy shit. Okay. Back and also, day. like, he, he can be quite, like, self-aware as well. Like, there's, <laughs> there's a lot no, of... No, I think that's another yeah. thing. He's super meta about it. I think that yeah. he is very much like a... And I think this is why he appeals to me, is he's directly in my age range. So he was just old enough to be there when the internet happened. So he's aware to make these references and be aware about this and rap this way, but still piss off old heads who might be like, you know, well, you're not Styles P or Jada or X or Y, right? Like, you're not hard all the time. Although, in other ways, he is hard all the time, as we'll get to when we get to other albums. (laughs) So... But I, I mean, direction. also on like the self awareness tip, there's there's a line on here where he says something like my my arm got strengther instead of stronger, and he's like that doesn't make any sense. Like he, he says that after the line, so he does that kind of like that playful stuff, you know, where he'll just make up some kind of bullshit and then acknowledge that yes, that was bullshit. But the fuck are you going to do about it? You know, like 
yeah, that's kind of more where, where I was <clears throat> going with that. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. I'm, no, I, I think mean, this album's really fun though. Like, and yeah, yeah. it's a cloud rap album. I think it's like of its time, but a little late for its time. Like, we're talking about cloud mm. rap. I think like that heyday was 2010, 2011. This came out in 2013, so I think it's a bit late for the zeitgeist, unfortunately. Like, um, but yeah, I think I enjoyed the second half more than the first half on this. I don't think it really picks up until those I don't remember. I think the second half is a nine. I think the first half is a seven. Mm. I used it out in an eight. Um, I have it's not one of those, the first half at least is one of those things you kind of need to listen to it like 3 a.m. You know, it's like one of those very late night introspective listens at first. Well, I guess probably the majority of the album is, but the Cauldron is like actually quite a you know heavy introspective song, which is probably quite easy to not really soak it all in the first time you listen to it. You know, like it's and then one you of you have to think about. I was drunk when I wrote this. Like, yeah, think the context of him being drunk when he wrote this. And again, I need to. I need to come back to this. I think I'm giving the first half a bit short shrift. I'm not trying to be dismissive of it, but I would say that, I mean, and I'm not saying there's no bad songs on here again. And I encourage everybody to check this out and I will come back to this, but it's the second half that I really gravitated towards on repeat. Listen was that once hose, I don't remember kicked in. I thought that was great writing and tomorrow's gone. It's always been a song that I've truly loved. And I think that once, you know, it comes from there, like I think the end run is remarkable. I think it's weird that the, ratings on RYM are lesser for the end run than the previous run, but RYM's weird. RYM thinks that the second half of the Zaloopers album is worse than the first half because RYM is fucking stupid sometimes. So, yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at kind of um, reviews for X's stuff from the time when it came out, a lot of it is like really fucking way off the mark too, so I don't think people really got it a lot you know, at the time, to be honest. That is true, yeah. Like, I mean, but yeah, like the of the time RYM reviews are just like, and we're not even talking about like 2003 RYM reviews, which by the way are the funniest ever. I encourage everybody to check out RYM reviews from like, you know, right when the site started. I can't mm. believe some of those still exist. They are like rare fucking dinosaurs. Check all of them out. Uh, knock it back. Shout out John Fox. Uh, yeah, this is a great album. It's probably the most. Artifact, aside from the Big Fat Kill, which is an artifact of a different era, for who the artist Esquire is right now, I think it's the most artifacty in that mm-hmm. it's of a scene that no longer exists. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the early 2010s was like, uh, it's really weird. So recently I, I rewatched the um, the video for Bird on a Wire, you know, all time classic song. Oh, video. yeah. Oh, yeah. That, and um, that makes me not want to put Riff Raff in a gulag. And I, and I, <laughs> but it was, I think it was the first time, you know, this is at the end of last year where I, I started to feel nostalgic for the 2010s and I kind of reflected on, it. I was like, man, there was a lot of really good, like, uh, kind of like party rap stuff in the 2010s that was, you know, also quite psychedelic and stuff like that too, which I think X was in that scene, but again, he had his foot in other doors as well, you know, so. Yeah. Bird on a Wire, I really fooled a lot of people, like, I'm this is not going to be the hate on Riff Raff podcast. I got. I've already mentioned him way more than I would like to. Um, but <laughs> all I'll say is that it is a crime that he has gotten so many hairy frog beats. That's it. Like that is. So all right. So from. Well, I guess live forever because uh, yeah. MD two is uh, December. Live forever yes, was October. So I guess for the sake of chronology, we will do live forever, which is one of his better releases overall. I would say. Yeah, it's really good. Um, uh, the train feature on here is not the band Train, thank God. No, it's just some some dude, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just some guy. Uh, although I would like to hear him rap over uh, Meet Virginia or Hey Soul Sister. Maybe he could save those if anybody could. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned earlier that there was a song that pointed out how exactly this dude was directly in my niche and I realized how like he was like in my age group and rapping about exactly the type of stuff I would like. I had the same feeling about Mike Eagle at some point and uh, nostalgia Funko land is that. song. Yeah. first of all, the fact that he calls it Funko land. That's like something that no, uh, I don't think you would realize that that is uh, what we call GameStop. Now I don't know if you have GameStops over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But uh, they used to be called Funko Land, which is, first of all, a terrible name for anything. I don't know why they thought that was good. It was a uh, rep, yeah. And so the fact that he called it that, I'm like, I rec- I clocked that reference, and then I'm listening to it, and like, I got literally every reference. So it's yeah. probably a level of fan service. 
to that degree. But on the other hand, the way he raps it is so passionate. But what really makes the song fucking work is the last third where he turns it into like this personal fucking narrative about how his life is fucked up and mm. what made him. And that's the Danny Brown aspect. That's the mm. atrocity exhibition. That's the triple X right there where it's like, I'm going to take these references. And like, that's, if you listen to the triple X episode, it's like, there's so many references on triple X, but what makes triple X resonate is how he takes them and turns them in on himself to make him say something about himself, about mm. his circumstances, about his life. And mm. that's what Xquire does in the final third of nostalgia it makes it so fucking powerful. And I know mm -hmm. that great Rangers, your favorite song on here, I believe. But this one is the one that got me in the fucking gut on the end, except for the last song, which is just fucking remarkable, too. Like, his yeah, rapping yeah. performance on Gold Mount Piranha is crazy. Yeah. And his creativity on Blood on the Moon Part 1 and 2 was crazy, too. Yeah. So, yeah. just super good. There's yeah. some sex rapping on here that's probably not going to be for everybody, but I can excuse it because, I mean, it's good rapping, and it's it gets more palatable every time I listen to it. Uh, mm -hmm. But Nostalgia, Blood on the Moon Part 1 and 2, and Gold Mouth Piranha, three of his very best songs, so I cannot recommend this enough just for those songs. Yeah, Nostalgia's like, um, in a way, it's kind of like a, a stream of consciousness to a, because he's just he's effectively listing things that are from his childhood, right? Yeah, it's no, like, it's pretty much just a list. He makes yeah, it yeah. rhyme, but it's a list, but then it's like, it gets progressively more intense, and then he starts mentioning his parents around the end. Yeah, that's that right. That's turn. Hmm. So there's like an intensity turn around like the two and a half minute mark in the song. And then it's like it's something triggers in him. And it's like somebody it's like a therapy session almost. Mm. There's something about it. It just becomes it ratchets it up, it ratchets up in intensity as it goes. And maybe it's because all of the reference points resonated with me. I don't know. Like again, maybe it's a fan service thing in that aspect, but it's just like the it's so well constructed that it did not feel like, uh, again, somebody we're going to talk about soon because he has a feature of the game thing where it's like references for the sake of references. All of the yeah, references yeah. felt to a purpose. Hmm. And it's, it's also, it's not like, say, when Logic makes a pop culture reference where it's just like some real entry level shit, like there's you know, some stuff in there which would probably go over a lot of people's heads, but it's like, oh shit, he didn't reference that. Similar thing with him re referencing Earthworm Jim. Like, not everyone's going to gonna get an Earthworm Jim reference, but he fucking went there. So, you know. Yeah, the earthworm, okay, the earthworm gym reference. <laughs> that I okay, I listened to this at work for the first time, and I push a computer on a cart around at work for my job because I have to go around and fix the problems of people who aren't very good at their jobs, is the reason mm -hmm. I have a job. And when he made the big gun like earthworm gym thing, I had to stop and park my <laughs> cart and laugh. Because all I could picture is earthworm gym fucking shooting his gun that was so big that he it like pushed him up in the air. <laughs> first warm gym man hurt for him. Uh, like have you have you watched the video for Green Ranger? No, I have not. Uh, I will uh, after <laughs> one of the comments is like this man figured out how to mix Power Rangers with twerking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah shit he did. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love Green Ranger, man. But um, Goldmouth Piranha, I was thinking about this, right? Gold, Goldmouth Piranha, he does some real, like, um, some real flexing, like, flow-wise and shit. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, this is what Eminem thinks he does when he does his really, you know, overly technical shit. But this is actually fucking fire. That, that's kind of one of the main takeaways I had from that song. I mean, I think a, um Never really glad when anyone mentions Eminem, just because you're I'm reminded of Eminem and I don't like to be reminded of Eminem. But I'm glad you mentioned me mentioned Eminem to a point because technicality is so hollow unless there's something to back it up. And I feel like X Choir has like these and Danny's the same way. And I'm trying to think of other examples. Like, I mean, Billy and Elusive, obviously like but like there's a showy technicality to Eminem that hides the fact that he has had nothing to say for like twenty fucking years. Like, mm. the last thing Eminem had to say is, I'm sober now. Right. Eh, 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 eh. Like that? Mm. Like that one? And, uh, but whereas I think Esquire, whenever he does something technical in a song, is to reemphasize a point about the theme of the song. Mm. Not just to show off, to jerk off that he can rap real well. I mean, he does kind of show, I mean, he, he shows off in that song. Here's a line where he's like, I'm smarter than Nicholas Tesla, Einstein, Dr. Robotnik. Like, <laughs> But okay, if you're gonna do that, like do it in a way that's like making 
Tesla Robotnik punchlines, not I can rape Lana Del Rey punchlines. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, I'm way more there for the Tesla Robotnik punchline than the rape Lana Del Rey punchline. <laughs> um, See ya. Because <laughs> one, yeah, I'm not really going to go too far down that rabbit hole because I already said <laughs> I never wanted to say twice. Um, yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, the, uh, I think um, that there's just something very hollow about the way Eminem raps that is that impresses people who otherwise would not listen to rap music. And again, yeah. I'm not trying to do the racial thing. I think that it's like a hollow technicality thing that also is like there for people who listen to rock music that mm. have the soul too. Mm. Yeah, um, I was going to say as well on that topic of of that song, Goldmouth Piranha. Um, there's a fucking some seriously sinister production on that song. Like the the low end is bananas at the end of that song. Yeah, there's some real like again. That's X Squire's uh, ear for production. I think uh, really the only production, really the only song I don't really like on here is No Pain No Gain. I feel like that's a little all over the place, both thematically mm. and production wise. Doesn't really do much for me, um, mm. even though it does like kind of tie itself together with what is doing with like the pain and gain thing, the sex theme versus the reward theme, etc. But I think the production's a little bland compared to everything else and mm. just doesn't stand out. Um, that's the only I one that I super like. And I, I see on looking at the track list, uh, the track ratings is the one that I guess everybody else agreed. Well, the intro, but whatever. The intro's mm. fine. I don't think the intro deserves to be rated that low. Um just some Brooklyn shit. <laughs> it's just some whatever. It's an intro, man. Like, yeah. what are people doing right in the intro that low? Uh, but yeah. So I really, I really like the the line on ice cups. Um, wild gentrification. I know what that means until I had some white neighbors. And that's a great <laughs> line. That I think that might actually be another aspect that has maybe put people off is that he's actually very. Well, I mean, a lot of rappers are, but he's like very pro-black and probably says a lot of shit that you know the average white hipsters not up on you know so that's another thing i think right and uh, you're right i think that's actually a lot of reaction to i mean you think about it he's in brooklyn at the turn of the 2010s he's probably mm. reacting he's on mishka he's bigged up by you know a lot of blogs he has a lot of lyrics that are fuck the bloggers you think about it there's a lot of yeah, yeah. lyrics that end in fuck these bloggers i yeah. think that like, I mean, what's one of the most memorable lyrics on the last is, ah, fuck a label, fuck a blog, fuck an AR, fuck a cosign, motherfucker, fuck it all. Like, yeah, I think that he's really reacting to, like, this, again, the whole gold rush aspect, like I was talking about, where it's, like, the, you know, rap equivalent of everybody signing, you know, we signed Nirvana, now we got to sign Guided by Voices, now we got to sign this and that, like, because we got to sign everybody, but now we're signing black people. Yay! Mm. Now it's uplift, right? Like now it's this and that. We signed Odd Future, right? We're doing something for the community, for all these mm. hipsters in Williamsburg, right? Like mm. I assume he's probably pretty jaded about that shit, and mm. probably rightfully so. So I mean, there's a whole there's a whole skit on um on Lost in Translation called Yeah Right, where it's like obviously two bloggers oh, from yeah, Now yeah, Right. Like com, yeah. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's also the rap, Lost, networking, yes, the rap networking skit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of this Yeah. Mm. Uh, also, as well, we should probably bring up Blood on the Moon. So, um, taking it back a little bit as well, I, I forgot to mention when we were talking about Man in the High Castle, the first song on that uh, mixtape is about him at his girl's house or something, and like the aliens abduct him and they start like pulling apart his brain. Yeah. And then he kind of he kind of does more kind of um, sci-fi fantasy on Blood on the Moon, where it's about him literally oiling from the moon and then it's like a chase scene right and then as they're getting chased he does like really uh rapid fire up tempo flow and shit so just very yeah, very it, creative stuff it really reminded me of um have you heard uh the lupe fiasco tape uh feral height um where he no, has, I yeah no there's a track it's uh it's him going over it's like six tracks an ep it's all jacked beats but it's all like kind of weird beats and uh, like not what you expect the last track. I forget what it is, but he's kind of doing a Slick Rick children's story thing, yep. but over a different type of beat. And yeah, he's kind of doing that, I guess. Um, like characters. And he does the children's story thing at the beginning of it too, right? Like, yeah. Uncle, yeah. yeah. So that's why I'm reminded of that. And 
I think that he has like a very vivid imagination where he takes his reference base and applies it to his psyche and tries to say like different things, like make different points, but he's also just, and I think another thing, I guess that's, we're the same type of person from the same type of time period. I think that's why it appeals to me. It's like, this is the type of shit I would think of when I'm just sitting around as a kid, not being parented, being parented poorly, watching the television, just let my imagination run wild. Mm. That's what appeals to me about this. Just like Mm. you're letting your imagination on spool. And but he's way more, way more betterer at just like phrasing it and rapping it, like just mm-hmm. putting it to paper and putting it over a beat that I would never think of. So you mm-hmm. have some like, and what it also reminds me of is uh, Gene Gray's Gotham Down, uh, mm-hmm. which is a concept album. But like, I, I can't even go into what Gotham Down is, but it's the same sort of thing. Very creative. It's like a choose your own adventure book essentially as a rap album, which is something no one else has ever really accom- like, attempted let alone accomplished so yeah i think that these are like artists that x choirs never even considered in the tier of that he should be for for things like this because mm. people don't even listen to this sort of shit and that's what i'm trying to get with this podcast like not that anybody really listens to this shit but you he deserves it like he really mm. writes on that level he raps on that level and people just only think of him for his remix or the fact that he's horny all the time and he is horny all the time but he did make the Zara remix but he also does shit like this. He yeah. is a really significant, talented fucking artist who writes on an incredibly high level. And on this tape, he at least has three songs that are on a high level with some of your favorite fucking rappers. Certainly better than fucking Eminem. Mm. He's, I just look at him as like everything an MC should be, right? Like he, he just covers, he's got all bases covered, you know? Like, can be some technical shit, some slow shit. He can be on some like conscious shit, some sexual shit, some nerdy shit, like any kind of topic, anything that is of interest to him, he can make into a good song, you know? I mean, yeah, I agree. Like he can make anything interesting. And I, and he has just like, ultimately, yeah, like you said it better than I could. And so I'm not going to try and improve upon it. So <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Um, so I, the next one on the list is Merry Christmas and SMD2, but I haven't heard it, so... Neither have I, I only heard three, so... And I didn't listen to Live from the Danger Room either, because we were saying we're not even sure what it actually is, or he's yeah, like, not so this definitely has something that is on, it has Ice Cups from this EP on here for sure, and otherwise, I have it, I've downloaded it, but, uh, illegally, sorry X. But uh, I do not know how much of it is actually X Choir content versus his friends and, you know, contemporary right. slash weed carriers. I've mm-hmm. not heard it. I may revisit it, but we did not listen to it. So we're going to be skipping over it for the intents and purposes of this podcast. All right. Well, does that bring us to Brainiac theme? All right. Brainiac, which um, was the time, basically, the first thing I heard in my casual listening to X choir way back in the day after lost in translation. Mm. And I had a very positive review of it with the exception of one track and re-listening to it. I'm still not a big fan of strawberry waterfalls, although I appreciate it more now. Still not a huge fan of it. I mean, yeah, yep. You know, <laughs> you know, I, uh... So a few things about that track is, first of all, it's pretty funny that he got an alchemist beat and then that sort of did over it. He, like, it's a great... I think that's what makes me more mad than anything. <laughs> 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 but I look at it as like like an I mean, ODB. If you pay for an alchemist beat, you can do what you want with it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> But I look at it as like an ODB thing, you know, like Old Dirty would just like do some singing shit, some real kind of obnoxious, over the top shit. And it's fucking funny, man. He has the line where he's like, she told me her favorite movie was Jurassic Park. So I ate her like a velociraptor. And then it's got like the rap. <laughs> that shit killed me when I first heard it, man. I, mean, I remember the first time I listened to this tape, I was dying. <laughs> three and a half minutes. Like, I feel like in a minute and a half, I would have thought it was hilarious. But at three and a half minutes, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I liked it better the second time around. I'm not going to lie. Like, once I have more to appreciate who X Choir is as an artist now, I enjoy it more. I rate it higher. I didn't re review it. I would re rate it higher. I would re rate I would re rate it higher now. Um, otherwise, I think it's pretty impeccable like on a rap level i think that you know pitching ain't shipping a ghetto dub man boy are great fucking songs yeah. like on a rap level yeah this is this is my favorite x squire project full stop um 
it just blew me away the first time I listened to it. And yeah, it's just, it's, I feel like it's got everything I like about them in one place, 21 minutes or just over 21 minutes. And it's just great production, um, like hypnotic shit. Um, I honestly think Man Boy is one of the best rapping performances of the 2010s, full stop. Like, he killed that shit. And like, it's just a crazy verse. You know, he's like dissing himself and then he's dissing a blood relative. We don't know who it is. I don't want to like pontificate. I've kind of, some people said it might be about Goldie Glow. I don't, I don't fucking know, but it's just, just I crazy. I didn't buy that. I'm looking at my review from around the time period. First of all, you were on this at the time, 29 July yeah. 17. You were on this at the time. Uh, I had to I, tell I people, it's so good. <laughs> the track Man Boy, although I full five lost in the saw. Shout out to Crutchy Black, friend of the show. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I can't believe I didn't full five Man Boy. Man Boy's a five. Uh, fucking unbelievable. No pedo. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is probably actually a nine now that I think about it. And Strawberry Waterfalls is fucking funny as an interlude. I can't believe that I was like, I think of it, if you think of it more as an interlude where he's just fucking around and everything else is just hard rapping as fuck, because that's pretty much what this is. Oh, yeah. He says some wild shit. 40s at the Met Gala, where he's got a, I think it's on that song where he's like, yeah. has a line about uppercutting your scrawny ass through the ceiling. Like, <laughs> just nasty shit, man. He's He goes off on this tape. Lost in the Source is real great, too, with the whole, like, the interlude where it's like, this is your brain. What the fuck is this? You know, that kind of shit. Like, no, just it's so, much, so much good shit on this man and um the mayhem feature is real nice it's got a funny outro and he's talking about you know calling an uber for someone and yeah it's great big yeah, fan i think that this is actually probably the intro i would use for esquire as opposed to lost mm. translation now that i think about it like even though it has strawberry waterfalls on here i would say that if you're not engaged by esquire's rapping performance on here he probably ain't for you mm. yeah no i agree um yeah, it's, it's all the all the raw skill and everything is, is just here, you know. Like it's uh, it's kind of all you can really, all you not everything, but most of the things that you can want from an X Y tape, you're going to hear on, on these these songs. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really, really fucking good. Um, I, I'm really sad that I did not give it a full re-listen for this project, just because I listened to it multiple times in the past, so I thought I knew it well enough. Mm. You know, re-looking at my review, and I'm like. God damn! I really should have hit this harder going back to it, just because it's so good and deserves another listen. And yeah, Contra uh, Contra Buzz has he done? Now I'm looking at his page. Has he really only done Esquire shit? I, I think so. I don't really know what else he's 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 been on. Eh? He's definitely. I, I look at him as like a continuation. His, his credits Deep are Bucks. literally all Esquire and one Cool AD tape. Okay. Well, his discography. He does have a bunch of beat tapes, and now I'm gonna have to. CP oh shit! Sure. No way! I like to shoot those out. Yeah, oh. he has uh, thirty, uh, thirty-two albums, and oh, thirty-two sure. albums. <laughs> All right. uh, we just have the Contra Buzz. We are going to be picking up your albums. I might be buying them on Bandcamp, so maybe we'll even have Wyatt throw in a link to your Bandcamp on the description because you <laughs> have killed it on every Xquire project, and we would mm-hmm. like to throw some money your way. So, hundred percent. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's anything really else to say about this. I just it blew me away. I still love listening to it. Um, Hilarious yeah, album crazy. cover, by the way. Like, oh yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Shout out so, to the varsity yeah. jacket. Uh, mm. um, so should we move ahead then? Yeah, I mean, I really don't have much else. Unfortunately, I can't quote it chapter and verse. But there are so many good lines on this. I wish I could. Oh yeah. But. Yeah, so I guess we would move on now to the self-titled, I believe. Or no, we'll do Exodus 3. That's from 2017. Yeah, okay. Exodus 3 is 2017. I only listened to some off of this, unfortunately, because yeah. I uh, real life intervened. But there's a few tracks on here I do want to speak on. Um, this has Timbaland's with Shorts featuring Friend of the Show, right. Al Rubino, um, which is uh, him going over a knowledge beat, which not everybody can do. That's a very exclusive club, and he kills it. It's a great mm-hmm. performance out of Al Davino. Uh, mm-hmm. One for Combat Jack is one of his top five songs. It has rest in peace, Combat, Combat Jack. Jack. Yeah, one of um, uh, rest in peace, Combat Jack. Uh, we, this show would not exist without Combat Jack. I just want to say that <laughs> is uh, yeah. he was the first one to do this. Uh, get ready for Combat. Dallas on the format. Um, if you don't know Combat Jack, I, I assume his work is still online somewhere. But he, he was here. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I think it is still on YouTube and shit, so definitely 
Yeah, he his, was the his, first his, person his, to actually do a fucking. It wasn't even a podcast; it was a fucking radio show, and he yeah. was the best to do it. Incredible yeah. radio show, radio host. Uh, yeah, so really inspired me to even do this. Pretty much everybody who did this from a certain time period knows Combat Jack. Dallas on the format. Get ready for <laughs> combat. Um, and yeah, there are so many killer lines on this. The one I was thinking of that I alluded to earlier was everybody knows Hitler, name one slave owner. Mm. Just hits on a million levels. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, he even has, like, he does keep to the format um, the concept a little bit on the first and last track. Even Roaches with Sleep and Krampus Freestyle are kind of Christmassy. And yeah, Roaches was Sleep is the Christmas song, right? That's got the line where it's like, um, what does he say? Say something like, once again, it's, it's Christmas, and um, and I'm pondering, how did Santa get in here if there's no um, no chimneys in the projects? <laughs> right, it kind of reminds me of um, Small Pro, and oh, what the fuck was it? Small Pro, I forget, it was like a, everybody, it's going to bother me, but uh, Small Pro did one song, I'm doing really bad here, but yeah, there's one good, another good rap Christmas song I didn't cover before, yeah. and yeah, Krampus Freestyle is like kind of a Christmas beat, and obviously the Krampus is the opposite, opposite of Santa, but yeah, this is a little more Christmassy than I think the other two are, not that I've heard the second one or really the first one, but everything else on here that I've heard is not Christmassy, it's just really, really good rapping over really good beats, um, you heard the whole thing, you say it's really fucking good, the ones I've heard are amazing, again, uh, one for Combat Jack is incredible, so I'm going to hear the rest of it. I assume it's, I've already put it at an eight. I assume it's going to be, continue to be an eight, maybe even a nine. Listen, listen to the rest of it. Get a chance to listen to Chocolate Rabbit? Oh, no. I listened to the first, yeah, that was the one after that, right? Oh, no, I did not. I listened to uh, Got Any Change, and then I listened to Tim Balloons with Shorts through to the end. So I did not listen to the middle two. So I did not listen to Chocolate oh, yeah. Rabbit, no. Chocolate Rabbit's a really powerful song. It's like a, um, it's a, I think it's like kind of like a storytelling song, but it's a dedicated to different people and stuff. It's, it's really good. Um, really like nice somber beat as well to it. So it's definitely like a, oh, a, a story song. So I definitely like it. Like I've never heard a story song because I didn't like, cause he's really good. Like I said about in addition to himself, just sketching out three dimensional characters and finding the humanity mm. in situations, which I think he, again, that's a Danny quality. I mean, I feel like I'm kind of shortchanging him by always comparing him to Danny, but it's like Danny was the first rapper I really gravitated towards that like showed me these qualities in rap, I guess. So I guess that I'm just using him as a reference point, but I don't want to come across like I'm accusing X of biting Danny or anything. I just think that Danny kind of bigged him up and put him on as because he's on kindred spirit. Yeah, definitely. So, because he's absolutely not. He's again, a one of one. I can't emphasize that enough. X Nobody else does what X Squire does. 100%. And again, another great album cover for this one. <laughs> oh, this is one. This is the uh, top 20 of all time. Christian <laughs> is bursting through this album cover. <laughs> um, yes. So, yeah. Capsule Volume 1 has a very, very low rating on RYM, and no one's heard it. You said it's not really worth seeking out. I think it's just like kind of half finished demos and shit, but I, yeah, I, I can't remember. People are upset about something. I don't know. Oh, he's, he has a comment. He actually wants people to pay for literal unfinished throwaways. Yeah. That's I don't know. Uh, Mr. Never got around to it. Friend of the show, um, so. it's, it's probably better than it's rating. Oh, definitely. It would be better than it's rating. There's no yeah, doubt. Yeah, about. Sure it can't be a one. I'm sure I could get his demos of three, but I also probably wouldn't pay for them either. Probably just. Yeah. Right. So be honest. But yeah, did not hear it. Can't, I, I did try and hear it. I'd rather hear the uh, whole drunken affair than this. Honestly, that was the one I was really interested to find, but unfortunately could not. Um, Wyatt, get on that. Um, but moving on to his debut album, finally, seven years after signed to a major label, Mr. Yeah. Motherfucking Esquire finally drops his debut album. And again, another Death great album. Fucking silence. Yeah. Yeah, it's fucked up. <laughs> it is, because this is actually very good. I yeah. don't have it at a six, but re-listening to certain tracks, I did not listen to the whole thing. Unfortunately, did not have the uh, time preparing for the podcast because I'm so fucking busy and whatnot. Uh, but I listened to the tracks that were really interesting. Rumblefish, I always loved and still holds up. Uh, the Wiki track, very good. Wiki track has a very funny line where he's talking about... Um, like Godzilla in a swimming pool or something. It's like just that's yeah, just yeah. words, but it's a dope visual. 
which that yeah. really struck me as like a very Doom line. Mm-hmm. Um, it, do, Fuck Boy is one of the best opening lines. Like, Fuck Boy and Rumble Fish are two of his very best songs, and uh, Nothing's What It Seems short film is one of his best concept songs. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I feel like if I actually listened to this front to back, I'd probably have it in eight. Like well, this, there are some it's, it's a weirdly structured album, to be fair. Like, the last song is just him talking, just talking. There's no no beat or anything. He's just having a, you know, a ramble. I mean, <laughs> um, that's Last Call by Kanye West. True, true. And, I mean, it does just follow a really great um, story. Well, I mean, there's, like, four minutes of a great song before it's, like, you know, uh, so Jay-Z, uh, blah, blah, I can't do this. And I'm, like, I can do this. And then No ID's brother was hip-hop. And uh, I'm, like, blah, 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 eight minutes. So, yeah, so there was a song before that. But, yeah, <laughs> still. Um. But so yeah, like in terms of the structure as well, like it opens with Fuckboy and then the rest of the album doesn't really sound like that. And, and I, I think I remember him tweeting about it. He was like, I made Fuckboy because it was like, well, not his words exactly, but what he was getting at was he made that song because it's kind of what people expected him to do. So, you know, did like a, just a fucking awesome banging ass song. And then the rest of it from there, it kind of does its own thing. The album isn't reflective of that at, at all, really. Um, no, I really like the weirdo punchlines on Pink Champagne. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was like, was like, yeah. <laughs> very MF Doom. The yeah. Champagne felt me as very like. I mean, maybe it's just I have Doom on the brain because I did the Doom episode last week. But Pink Champagne struck me as like his Doom influence most pronounced. Yeah, I thought I thought that song was kind of like Ghostfest esque as well a little bit with just the kind of I suppose the the kind of tone of the beat there. Um, also, just before you, uh, just on the topic of Fuckboy, there um, is a review from a certain RYM user for that particular song, and they said that uh, X Squire is, what do they say? Oh, I'm not going to other... call out who it is, but we can figure it out from what they've said here. Uh, it said, however, X Squire still isn't special as an MC. Fuck you, you're wrong. <laughs> he is the bomb. That's just misleading bullshit. Stop reviewing hip hop. I've had enough. <laughs> yeah, there are there are two reviewers who um, we take objection to on this podcast, and one endearingly so, the other maliciously so. One of you is uh, RYM's answer to Armand White, you need to fucking stop. And, uh, <laughs> the other one of you is RYM's answer to Greg Turkington, and because like you. you give everything four bags of popcorn. So uh, <laughs> we'll leave it to the listener to discover who is who. <laughs> it's a little game. Um, yeah, so it's now I've had that, got that on my system. Uh, definitely, maybe fucking crazy song. That instrumental is wild. It's like some, you know, like an intergalactic war ray gun shit going on. Here's some great lines in there. He does the whole, like, um, quote unquote, lyrical miracle flow on there, like, in terms of the actual rhyme scheme. He says some shit on there, like, got kicked out of uh, middle school, I pistol whipped the principal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that fucking line. Some hard shit. And then uh, Wiki comes in, you know, uh, well, his, his opening line is like, Bartle Swigger, and then he, you know, does some crazy shit. Um, and there's a really, really, uh, actually quite a powerful outro too, where the, the beat switches up, and he's just kind of like, the pain, the pressure, the anxiety, and all that kind of shit, which is like, really, really good. I think um, really Wiki is very good at finding rappers who are on his wavelength. Like, he's oh, just- Rude, he, um, who else has he worked with? A Navy. Uh, Earl, obviously. I just think Wiki is just very good at just finding rappers who just get him, especially. like, And he has no interest in breaking out. Like, I think there was like five seconds where Rap King could have been on that whole 2012 Mishka hipster wave thing, and then it was just like, nah, not really for him. And I think mm. that a lot of it probably comes down to like stardom substance issues like if you listen to any of wiki's music he goes into that where it's like you put something in front of me i want to do it and Mm. so maybe that's part of it but i think that it's just also the same thing that Squire has where it's like i make music for myself and a small niche of people and Mm. that's what it's going to appeal to and i think yeah and I don't know. I lost my point. But I think that there's not enough Wiki and Esquire songs. I think there's just this one. Yeah. They're an awesome GOA. They're really... Because they're both just so just New York as well. Like Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, there's nothing more... Literally, there is no more New York rapper than Wiki. Like, Wiki is literally just like uh, Aki, Bodega, Bet, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Films like, a video on a, a bag of awesome. New York cliches in the best possible way. So. Mm. I actually, but as a side note, I um a couple of years ago I saw a, I was at a music festival that Rat King performed at, and I have a theory <laughs> that that's when Rat King broke up because they had a really their set was like um, the sound was all fucked up, and you could see them like arguing with each other and shit on stage. It was wild. So I feel like not long after that, no, yeah, seriously, not long after that, Rat King was no more, and I feel like maybe that show was the catalyst. Oh man, with you, so you um, shout out to Thought Fell, you broke up Rat King. <laughs> oh, the audience, man. I wasn't playing for sale. But then, uh, actually, literally, yes, later, literally, you're responsible. Uh, but then, a, a few years later, Wiki came to Wellington and he, he had a show for like literally five dollars, and it was awesome. He had no hype, man. He did all of his songs like perfect. He was really, really good live. So, shout out to Wiki for that five dollar uh, show. Yeah. Wiki is. I'd like to do a Wiki episode at some point. Mm. Uh, Probably with Sophia, because again, she's nuts. She's heard all of his stuff and can write chord mm. and verse. But yeah, this album's I need to give it a revisit because I only heard the songs that I wanted to revisit for this project. I remember listening to it the first time and I'm like, this is good but disjointed when I heard it at first, so I mm. gave it a six. And now I'm listening to it again and I'm like, the stuff that's good on here is great. <laughs> did and, you um, did you re-listen to I Love Hose? <laughs> I did not. And that's why I'm like, I need to revisit this. But I remember that being a sore thumb when I listened to it the first time. And I don't know, man. Like, it's, it's a little B song. It's what it is, like, straight up. Right, it's just, yeah. Where he just says one thing a million times. And it's got some really funny lines. He's got a, and he's listening to the types of things that he wants. To, like, finally take your debut album and do a I Love Ho Swag, 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 <laughs> Will B song in 2019. Like that's that's funny. It's barely over a three on the site. It's like inching over a three, um, right? Which I think I is not deserved. I, I even with my lukewarm opinion on it, having not, it's probably I don't know. No one cares about these incremental opinion things on like fucking numbers, but it's it's a good album. I'm glad that he finally got to put out the debut album he wants to, but mm. yeah, it's. Just join. I mean, no one would deny it's just join it. And yeah. I would also say that, yeah, like I think Lost in Translation, Brainiac, and even maybe something like Man in the High Castle are better representations of who he is as an artist. But you also have like Fuckboy, the Wiki track, uh, the scenes from Romy track, or like certain things like that on here are like representations of him just like having matured as an artist and being able to take that major label money that they forgot they gave him and finally put this out. So. Mm-hmm. There's that, like, there's that to say for it. So, oh, I was just, and just man, more obviously. So, yeah, like, I think it's like halfway there as a fully formed statement, and halfway there is like, uh, I had to put this out because otherwise I could never put anything else out. So, in that hmm. case, here's I Love Hose. So, well, the thing about I Love Hose, a couple of things. <laughs> so, there's a really funny line, I guess, at the end, he's listing the types of hose that he likes, and he shouts out, um, Something like corporate hoes who fuck for a portfolio, and then he says, <laughs> "Elderly hoes who survive polio." <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, all right. That's uh, I almost want to just like fucking up it to it just for that. That's and then and and like at the end of the song, he's in just... America who can't survive polio anymore because no one's taking the vaccine anymore. <laughs> um. And then uh, at the end of the song as well, he's like, great. You, you hear him cracking up where he's like, I, he, he pretty much says that's the dumbest song I've ever made, but I love it. So, you know, maybe it's not the best place, you know, to put the song. I find it funny. I can see why people, other people don't. But if you find Lil B funny, you don't find that song funny, then that's a gigantic double standard. Um, Rumblefish, I'm a big fan of as well. Like, really yeah. great um, kind of, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? Like a... Like an introspective song about like his childhood, I guess, but it's also um, the, the it's got a very playful flow to it. Yeah, I, mean, song I think it's, again, he's taken a reference point that's very specific. I've actually I've read the book, I've not seen the film, um, mm. but I don't think you need to know the reference point to oh, get. No. What, yeah, it's a book by um, do you know the Outsiders? S. E. Hinton, Pony Boy, that shit. I'm, I'm vaguely familiar, yeah. Yeah, uh, Rumblefish is the other book by that author, and uh, Coppola made a movie about it, 
I believe. Mm. Yeah, and so called Rumblefish. It's the same thing. It's like teenage gangs and stuff. So that's what that title is in reference to. Um, yeah. So again, that's the ref. Again, same sort of '80s reference point type thing that lends some character to it, but isn't essential to understand the song. No, so, not at all. Yeah. And, and he also uh, talks about the surveillance state on Nosedive, which is, um, I like it. I, I feel like what he's talking about is all pretty accurate. The second verse from, like, the guest, you know, maybe gets, not intentionally, but maybe gets a little bit q <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's some just some interesting choices on this album, and I think that the good songs are really fucking good, and I, I, I rate those really good songs as a definite maybe. Rumblefish, and um, I think nothing is what it. Sorry, nothing's what it seems is really great too. So, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm fuck gonna it, revisit fuck it as a whole. I when I revisited, I really liked. I um, I was lukewarm on it when I heard it before, but I didn't dislike it. Certainly, mm-hmm. I felt like it was the statement he, for better or worse, wanted to make. And I feel like he was jaded by the industry, and this was his cutoff point that he had to make. And he at least put out. Buckboy and Rumblefish on here, which are two of his very best songs. There is a um, wrestling reference on here to uh, SummerSlam 94 that is, oh, like is the most, that is the most deep cut, fucking accurate ass wrestling reference that is just like, if you don't get that, like, if you get that shit, it's like, oh my God, Luger and Yoko do it. Like, what? I could just hear Caleb being like, you're losing us viewers. You're losing us viewers. <laughs> Every second you talk about this shit, shut the fuck up. But, like, that is like what X Squire does. Like if you get the references you make them like that, it's like on point. And mm. if you don't, it doesn't really ruin the song. It's like two bars. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So and that's kind of the same shit it is with Doom too. Like I don't get some of the shit Doom saying about like I don't know what Sigma the Sea Creature is. Right. But pleased to meet you. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Straight up. <laughs> so Cool. Yeah. Uh, should we move on to so, the... yeah, so I guess the uh, Confessions of a Sex Addict is the next one. Yeah. All right, I was dreading this. I was dreading this. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, it's not all the way something I'd play again, but mm. I really liked it. It this is his most Danny Brown album for sure. Yeah, this yeah. like in both flows and content. I think his most Danny Brown album. The fact that it's under a three on RYM there, now that I see it. Under 100 ratings, by the way. Fuck off. I didn't rate this. Four stars. Yeah, fuck that. Under three? I hope I got it over three. Should have. People are grossed out. I think yeah, it's th- over three. I got it over three. Shout out to Patrick. Oh, yay. Uh, that's, that's, that's that it wasn't over and three. And number 100. Bullshit. Um, yeah, no, this is really good. It's more than the sum of its quote-unquote gross subject matter because... It's not gross subject matter. I mean, it's graphic subject matter, but it's not gross. As we've established before, he's not bragging. Mm. Um, erase my browser history. <laughs> like oh, he's not bragging. Really yeah. Um, I love. I love the how it, like the end of erase my browser history. He like talks about how he was going to write another verse and about like the psychology. Oh yeah. No, and he's <laughs> about, like, one long- no, he has that one line about like tears and a cum drop. He's like, I had another verse. Oh, like, yeah, this yeah. ain't about that shit. This ain't why you watch porn. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really like the production on this. I think this is maybe like his best produced album, honestly. It's like I a really cool drifting neo where he like song. borrows production from other people. That's so great. But in terms of like original production for himself, probably mm. I mean Kismet's really good. Like Kismet mm. has really good production. But yeah, like in terms of a compact production for himself. Yeah, this is great. Like, it's beautiful. Um, mm. I think that uh, Sweet Revenge into Snowfall is some really good storytelling. Yeah, and Sweet then, Revenge is amazing. Sorry, what? I, I reckon Sweet Sweet Revenge is, like, an amazing song with the, the like, the symphony at the end where, you know, it kind of, like, melts the song. It's really, really cool. Um, Adina Howard is a better song that ref... I mean, I'm a... Uh, pander to you right now. Adina Howard's a better rap song that uh, references Adina Howard than Backseat Freestyle. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't like Backseat Freestyle. So oh. I'm 
<laughs> I'm also pandering to a friend of the show, Diction, right there. Guest of the show, Diction, who also does not like backseat freestyle. I mean, y'all are wrong, but, you know, it's fine. You can be wrong. It's cool. You're okay to be wrong. But uh, at least at least Kendrick's only making a Brock album with somebody not Morrissey, unlike a uh, friend of the show, ASAP Rock, Rocky, who is doing a rock album with Morrissey, which we're all really looking forward to. Can't Come wait on. to do that. Mm. I had no idea that was happening, but all right. Oh, no, I don't know if it's still happening. I mentioned it previously, and I had to explain to uh, Sphinx who Morrissey was. And, uh, yeah, I was like, nice. yeah, and um, we would explain that he made chimey guitar music with lyrics that were emotional, and then he was a fascist. Yeah, no, he's a fucking supreme dickhead, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing about this album, though, right, is it's, it starts off very funny. Like, it's, you know... Yeah, Quite it's a Danny Brown album. Fun. It starts off funny and then it gets sad. Yeah. And then it's, I guess, quite hopeful at the end where the song was about his daughter being born and it ends with a recording. And yeah, that's why really it's um, being born. <laughs> All right. So I made a New Year's resolution after listening to the recordings of the past two episodes is that Patrick is not going to make every episode about his fucking daughter. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to really try and, but it's really very hard for me after the year that I've had to not hear a song like the last song on this and not think about my daughter. Mm. Cause it's very much about the daughter that he has not had yet. Yeah. Um, but it hits me in the fucking gut. I mean, I have yeah. not had the life experiences X choir has had spoiler alert, as I'm sure you all be very surprised from listening to this show full of me talking about all the fish that I've listened to that I have not had the sex that X choir <laughs> has had. I know y'all be shocked. But, uh, yeah, um, this is a very surprisingly emotionally powerful album. Yeah. Thankfully. Like, and I think this is a testament to how good of a writer X Squire is that he can set you out for the punch, set you up for the gut punch as opposed to just the punchline. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I, I've kind of seen in my reviewers the personalities the whole way there as well. And it's just, yeah, it's. It's really good. That's a lot better than you people might expect. Um, so give, give it a try, I say. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's just the title of it and the fact that people have written X Choir off has just made people not even like give it a second thought. But mm. yeah, I think that it's worthy of it. It doesn't require that much of your time, and it's funny. It's surprisingly heartfelt. It's mm. really not that much it's not as gross as a lot of this stuff it's not as gross as you would not think gross. i mean yeah it's gross in some points but it's more funny than it is gross yeah 100 percent. so yeah um so no i, I just I realized really hurt so there's one more on here um then we'll get well okay so the way i wanted to structure this there's one more on here but one of the things about x choir is that he made his name doing a lot of features that are very notable so i think that what we should do here is hit his singles and like his loose season features real quick and then we'll hit his last project yeah. and then we're going to kind of land the plane so yeah we have basically i'm looking at his singles page here stuff we haven't covered maybe so, like, he has a uh, like, uh, think well he has black mirror with mad lib he has a uh, bootlicker, which was a uh, protest single in the wake of the state murdering George Floyd. And he has the doorway unfinished, which I downloaded. I actually bought, but I don't did not listen to, unfortunately. For this year. So. So, yeah, so I've heard bootlicker. I've heard Black Mirror. I've not heard doorway. And we can talk about some of the features as well. And then we'll get to uh, separate you from you. Yeah, cool. All right, so uh, as far as the loose and features go, Black Mirror. Uh, why doesn't Mad Lib release some albums with these people? <laughs> Do it. Because he's making albums with Logic instead. Which part oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think there's like five <laughs> MED albums coming this year. Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, uh, Black Mirror is amazing. It's four minutes yeah. of uh, X Choir over a uh, Mad Lib beat just being really heartfelt and funny and amazing, and y'all should hear it. Um, yeah. It's just like when Wiki went over a Mad Lib beat, except it's three times as long. Mad Lib yep. does this all the time. It makes me really mad, Lib. So, yeah. Uh, also has a very, very good music video um, for this one. Very. I've, um, not, I've not seen the music video. I'll check it out, though. It's, it's, just, it's just him kind of hanging out, but there's, I think there's a bit of his mother as well, and they light some candles. and Yeah, it's really, really heartfelt song, and he kind of... Um, 
makes lots of references to, you know, like the slave era as well. And he's obviously, he's got a very good um, historical understanding of a lot of things as well. He, he definitely is a rapper that reads a lot, I think, um, which is another thing we haven't really kind of touched on, but I don't right. know. Yeah, he's actually a very informed guy. Yeah, he, that's the thing. Is I think that he gives a lot of con, like he's, and then he shares this with Danny as well, is that he bullshits a lot and makes a lot of dumb jokes, but ultimately is very literate and mm. uh, has a lot of context for what he's doing. And that's like, makes a lot of his humor black, like dark humor. And mm. so, yeah. And then that leads to something like bootlicker, which is not just a like cry of rage, which it very well could have been and should have been. But mm. most of what bootlicker is, is talking about the past and how we're just repeating the past. Mm. And spoiler alert, we're going to mm -hmm. forever. This is going to happen yep. again. It's going to fucking happen again. Like, mm -hmm. let's not kid ourselves, man. So, like, and there's an exhausted tone to that, that just, and he names names, he calls out precedent, and it doesn't feel like a lecture, it just feels like an exhausted, like, I mean, it's hard to talk about, but it's a very good song. Like, yeah. it's a very good song that's a very necessary thing that is not super easy for me specifically to talk about because I don't want to white explain anybody, but mm. I also, um, it's a good song. Like, yeah, listen to it. Yeah. Listen to it. Fucking listen to it. I feel like there was a spate of very good songs that should have never been made in that period. Conway, right. Jim Jones, everybody made really good songs. that should never fucking had to happen. So, mm. yeah. Um, there was a, so as far as features go, we had uh, in the same year he was on uh, both L's album and Alchemist's album. He was on uh, Hell No, Oh Hell No, on Cancer for Cure and on a uh, Russian Roulette. I will have to look up the title of that, but he was also on Alchemist's uh, Russian album. So, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on those? Because I can't, like I said, I can't really call up his verse on C four C, and I would have, I can't really also call up any thoughts about the Alchemist. But do you have anything on those? Um, it's been a while since I listened to um, Oh Hell No today, but I was kind of only half paying attention, but very energetic, technically impressive verse. You know, it's what you expect from the guy. He's the middle verse, right? And then it's Danny at the end. Uh, <clears throat> the Alchemist song um, is, I mean, it's someone on an Alchemist beat. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, like, Russian Roulette, by the way, is now in the all like super slept on like anytime alchemist decides he's going to do a beat tape around a theme y'all should hear it um ignore the rym ratings this one yeah, is, is like super slept on uh this was the first i believe this was the first time he actually like experimented with this and he some people thought it was kind of corny but i always thought it was charming and then he would go on with israeli salad and mm. now he's got like a whole cottage industry out of it he put out cycles last year with the whole video from uh, Nick uh, Jason, Gold. Jason Goldwatch that was beautiful. And so, yeah, I think that he's really found his niche just doing these theme beat tapes. And I mean, um, what was the now I'm going to look up the Russian roulette thing because I think there was one verse on Russian roulette that I really loved, and it wasn't Esquire. Well, Esquire's was good, but there's a real nasty rock, nasty song in there. <clears throat> it was probably uh, Decisions Over Veal Warloff with Rock Marcy. Well, my brain is broken when I can just call that title off off the top of my head. Oh yeah, it was <laughs> uh, we're just there's a lot that. of um, there's a lot of alchemist shit that RYM needs to catch up on, like from that era though. Eh? Like um, the Do Rag Dynasty album is really well produced too, and but no, I mean yeah, to but that's also just like Do Rag Dynasty versus um, which is I can understand why people kind of fell off on that. I think the Gangrene stuff is really mm. left on. Um, the yeah. Greenberg EP is one of my favorite things, and I feel like we, honestly, I want to hold the L on not really repping for that on our episode with Rock, that I wanted to say a lot more about that, but I felt like that episode was like 17 hours long, so yeah, I didn't cool. say as much as I wanted to about that. But yeah, the Greenberg EP, people, more people need to listen to that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so I guess, speaking of episodes... I'm just trying to think of any that. other kind of notable features. Oh, here's a feature on the first Starface album, which is pretty good. Um, it's like... It's like a beat switch, and he comes in at the very end. Um, it was the first Zarface album, so I already had a pillow and a warm and a warm milk, and I was already down. So you can tell me about that, though. Uh, and also, uh, 
I'm going to shout out something from last year that only like a couple of people listen to. Um, there's a rapper called Noise82, and it's uh, it's called Blade Runner Buskia, and there's an X Squire verse on that. He's one of the only guests in the album, and he, he kills that shit too. If you want to hear, I downloaded that because you told me to download it, and I don't yeah. fucking remember it. But uh, yeah, I totally have it. My uh, he's apparently also on uh, Mike Delete Later by uh, Chris Crack. Shout out to uh, oh yeah. Fucking um, yeah, Satan Doobie, who a uh, friend of the show, who is uh, Chris Crack's biggest fan. I really remember liking a lot about this album and not listening. I mean, he got a Nicholas F first, for God's sake. How, mm. That's the rarest of animals. I mean, only him and Drew get that recently. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's another song I want to shout out that he features on. Keisha, <laughs> the name of the X Choir song on here is Keisha Coleslaw. That's just. Uh, <laughs> That's a chef's kiss. <laughs> Fuck, what was the song? Chris Crack remains the best song titler in the game. 100%. I'm now just going to read the Chris Crack song titles right now. If she ain't, too ain't, she ain't a lady, Jesus dropped the charges. Also, the events were re- appearing real. Ghetto until proven fashionable. King of the living room. Fapping ruined my life. Cross sex is friends. <laughs> Trill is an omno- onomatopoeia. Kaiser Permanente. Keisha Coleslaw, Poisonous Paragraphs, Cream Ties Are Consensual, Throw Privately, Flip Phone Hang Up, Gut Feelings, Just Guardian Angels. Shout out to Chris Crack. You are yep. better at naming song titles than you are at being friends with Vic Spencer. <laughs> Crackers live longer than vegans. Um, I just remember <laughs> I was going to mention um, this. He's on the Mugs Mayhem Loren album, um, the first one they did. Uh, Can't remember brunch, what it's called. Brunch one, the brunch. Up in, uh, thing. The Equinox or something, but it's him, uh, Mayhem, and Sean Price. And there's a oh, line. Sean yeah. Price on. Uh, I can't believe I forgot he had Sean Price on his song because that's just like the best match ever. There's a funny line on that song where he's, he says say something like, um, was always cursing, got kicked out of school, got kicked out of fucking class or something like that. Yeah, so he's like, yeah, he like I that. Yeah. And he's getting kicked out of class. He was really a problem in school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's like a whole bunch of just features that I'm obviously forgetting, but he was showing up quite a bit for like a pretty small window, right? Like 2012 to maybe like 2014. He was on quite a few things. Yeah, I think that he like, yeah, had that really small period where he was like making the most of his buzz mm. and like really killed these features and then just disappeared off the map for a bit. And then just, came, mm. and again, like I think that these legend, like hopefully we get the other volumes of these legend series that he will put out all the shit that he was working on that he didn't get to release. So, mm. Yeah. All right, so I guess we will wrap up with uh, the separating you from you or... Letting go of you for Y-O-U. Yep. Yeah, I did you listen, So you listen to, to like, obviously a certain song that you listen to, but did you only hear some of it or all of it or... Okay, unfortunately, due to life, I was only able to listen to the... Um, it was amazing that in 2021, he was able to get all of G unit to reunite for this feature. It was really <laughs> impressive. I'm Included. really sure that thanks still feels that way about vaccines though. <laughs> Including the game. <laughs> Only a few yeah, bars still cut game not. out of the verse though. Cause no one wants to hear from game. You forgot I'm in the group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that shit killed me. Uh, I don't really oh want to spoil it. Hey. I feel like people should just listen to it and just, yeah, just the whole, like, this sounds like some G-Unit shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, just to not, just to explain the joke for the listener who cannot share it with us or who doesn't want to hear the song. Basically, uh, he cosplays as everybody in G-Unit circa 2005, including Lord Lloyd Banks circa 2021 doing an anti-vax bar. Ending with game in 2000. You forgot I'm in the group. <laughs> like he, like Tony Yayo doing his yelling shit, like 50 Cent pretending he's Jamaican. It's just amazing. It's a thing of beauty. Yeah. Um, he ends yeah. it pretending he's also everybody in Wu Tang because everybody acts like he's Method Man. So I think that was mm-hmm. kind of sarcastic. Like, uh, dig at that. And it's less funny, but still good. Like, he's a good mimic. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, the G unit thing's the funniest thing. I also listened to the Confessions of a Sex Addict alternate outro because I thought it might have been like the emotional stuff he was talking about, like the verse he lost, where he was like, I had a bunch of other shit. It's not. Right. It's just some sarcastic shit. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's all I really got to hear from this, unfortunately. I wanted to hear the whole thing because um, it sounded interesting. He's charged, he said it's pay what you want to. Apparently, mm. all you want to pay is 25 bucks because that's all yes. you have the option to pay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but. I will get to listening to all of it because I'm sure it's all pretty good. I'm sure it's all pretty funny. It dates back to at least 2013. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's yeah. just him fucking around more or less. But Esquire is yeah. really good at fucking around. Yeah, that's so like there's these Koji main interludes, which I think. Uh, oh no, the Koji main interludes. That's him, right? Koji main interlude too. Yeah, that's, that's really funny. Being a different character, which is quite funny as well. Yeah, he's he's definitely um, flexing his, his vocal cords on this a bit eh, in terms of imitating and making new characters and shit um it cracks me up though that on the Bandcamp page it's got like release november 5th 2021 i don't know who made any of this shit to be honest <laughs> <laughs> so it's obviously just like random lucies that he's kind of compiled together um, the first this, half might have made all this shit like last week like the week before he put it out and just is fucking with everybody like that could have struck me as something he would do too like, with the, like the one song that the guy on the C box can date back to 2013. Xquire mm-hmm. strikes me as somebody who could just literally just made this shit together. He's so good at like imitating stuff. He could have just like imitated how shit sounded back in 2013 to just fuck with people. Like mm. I could see him doing that. Yeah, that's, that's um, a good point. Yeah. Um, so the first I half of the man so- shows up like more than once. Um, does he sound yeah. like Mace on Mace Flow? Does he actually do that? Like, does he does he have a Mace Flow on Mace Flow? Can we welcome him back? Oh shit! See, I don't really know enough mace to make that make that call. To be honest, um, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Yeah, I, uh, I think you need to get your Harlem World game up. I actually mm. quite, uh, yeah, I actually quite enjoy Mace's flow, even though he's trash. But um, so the first half of this is like mostly soul samples as well, which is quite nice. Um, Second half, I feel like is when you can kind of tell that he's fucking around a lot. Um, there's a song on here. Sorry, not even really a song. Um, the the track 14, Embrace You, is just him kind of giving advice or saying that he's available to give advice. And he uh, gives away his phone number on the, on this particular song. <laughs> so if you want to give XY a call, that's where you go to get that phone number. If I was uh, more ambitious, I would, in fact, call him on the air right now and see if we can get his advice. But unfortunately, yeah, I, am yeah. too much of, I am too much of a coward to do that. <laughs> so that will not happen. But... Um, so, listen to this last night. Um, I'll just kind of point out the songs that stuck out. Ooga Booga uh, is really good. He's got a really some real nasty lines on there. There's something like he says a line um, saying like, "Oh, something like he'll beat you to death with a lint roller," and then he was like, "I'll do a drive by in a sanitation truck, literally street sweep you up, or something like that," which I thought was pretty funny. Um, there's a song here, uh, number seven, um, bed wenches, coons and bucks. That's what it's called. Um, and again, it's a song where it's kind of providing historical context to certain things, I suppose, relating to the black experience and also, um, kind of dating outside of your race. Uh, the song, no sweater, uh, I'm pronouncing that wrong, but that is track number 16. Um, begins with him recording a verse and then he like drops his drink and he's like oh man I dropped my drink and he goes on this huge kind of rant about it but it's actually about him um, being monogamous so a bit of growth there from the man himself Um, I will believe it when I see it (laughs) just having Uh, listened to enough of this man's music I will believe it when I see it however I will also believe him because if he's one of the most honest rappers I've heard so if he says he's monogamous I would actually believe it. So, yeah, I feel like there's a song or two later on where he's talking about, you know, just fucking bitches, but that's probably maybe recorded before then. I don't know. It's a whole bunch of shit on Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, we don't know when any of this was recorded. So, and he also says, new album coming soon. Yep. He's done it a few times. Like, there's supposed to be an album called Black Genius. Still hasn't came out. He, like, says at the end of Brainiac, Black Genius coming soon. Still waiting, but. It's cool, man. You can do what you got to I mean, do. I guess that's the problem here. Is I generally like to end. End. You have me talking in the 
dumb racist accent now, but it's not good. <laughs> um, I generally like to end the episode like with some sort of final question, either like, what's the entrance point? What's the best thing? I think we've already established, I think, Lost in Translation, you think Brainiac, although I think we could both be talked into either being yep. our point. And uh, I guess final question, where do you think Esquire ranks in terms of 2010s artists like like how significant is he what kind of influence is he going to have mm. yeah because i think that like we know what the entrance points are for people like the listen to the huzzah remix we know what they should listen to and i think that he's prop but like there certainly is stuff out there people can find but how significant is he and where mm. are people ultimately over time going to rank him as yeah. well i mean currently i feel like the populace isn't ranking him high enough Exactly, I, and that's why we're doing this episode. I, I, so I, I think that like twenty years from now, like hopefully there will mm-hmm. be a lot more of a canon. Like hopefully that's why we're doing shit like this, is so people. Well, will I mean, find this after this episode changes everybody's minds. Uh, exactly, <laughs> after everybody <laughs> to everything. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really hope that people do catch on and figure it out. Um, I feel like it's probably going to be more apparent over the next over this, you know, the twenty twenties. Perhaps people will be like, oh, okay. You know, like they'll they'll kind of have a better understanding because, like, another thing worth mentioning, I think, is like independent hip hop now is, I guess, like, would you say it's getting more coverage than it was in the two thousands? Like, in terms of you know, like on the wider scale of things, like, do, would you say that more people are aware of Armored Hammer now than people were aware of, say, Cannibal Ox in the in the two thousands? I would say that. More people who want to be aware of that sort of thing are, but I think on a large scale, no. But I think mm. that in terms of coverage for people who are looking for it, yes. Mm. So, yeah, so I think that it's a double edged sword. I don't know if mm. I'm phrasing this properly, but like, I think something like the Earl album drop right now would have been something that would have been something that would have taken up. I'm trying to picture how like Earl's album coming out as a traditional album drop would have worked 20 years ago versus now. Right. And like the Cannibal album, like that came out and I think it was like something that took like five, 10 years to really resonate versus like right now, everybody's like already got their fully formed opinion, positive or negative or neutral on the Earl album. Mm. And I mean, I like how you tied it back to Earl. Um, but I want, like, one of the things I want with the show is for people to re-evaluate something like Esquire, like Brainiac, which I think is essentially almost perfect, except for the one song, which I think is a charming little interlude. Mm-hmm. That, Or something like Lost in Translation, which is something that seems of its time, but is a really great work of personal passion and lyrical genius that did not necessarily get its due because it felt like it was just of its time, just because it was a wave of rappers who were quote unquote doing the same thing. But yeah, um, I think Esquire is very significant and his best work is ahead of him. And I hope that this episode probably, I mean, I'm not going to be so presumptuous as to say that it will point anyone in one direction or another, but I hope that if one person listens to one Esquire project, we've done our job. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I, I really don't know what he's going to put out next or when that's going to come out, but looking at his, his Twitter, it seems like he is gearing up to drop a lot of shit. I, I know that he's been like, doing a lot of features, whereas, like, you can get a feature from XWire for, like, $50, for example, if, if you wanted one. So he's definitely, I guess, trying to re-enter the, the public sphere in that sense. Um, and I also do wonder as well as, like, if, if he were to come out now, he probably would be considered one of one of the better rappers. I feel like he was kind of, like, maybe bef- before his, his time in a lot of ways. Um yeah, in terms of, especially now, I feel like there is, if you look at like, say, 2007 or, you know, the mid-2000s when there was a lot of backlash to commercial hip-hop and stuff, but people weren't really checking for uh, underground to the extent that they are now. But like, 
now because more people are, you know, it would be the right environment for him to drop some shit that would really change people's minds if that makes any sense. No, it does. And I think that if nothing else, I hope that this changes people's minds to check out his back catalog. Uh, mm-hmm. also out, thank you for bringing this to my attention. I hope this has brought his catalog to other people's attention. We are living off borrowed time, and our intro music is Union Classics uh, Borrowed Time Instrumental with Billy Woods. Our outro music, as always, is Stagnated Pace by Can Kick, and we will see you next time. Peace. Well. Time will dawn upon us.